Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners By John Bunyan A Preface Or, Brief Account of the Publishing This Work Written by the author thereof, and dedicated to those whom God hath counted him worthy to beget to faith, by his ministry in the Word. Children, grace be with you. Amen. I being taken from you in presence, and so tied up that I cannot perform that duty, that from God doth lie upon me to you ward, for your farther edifying and building up in faith and holiness, etc. Yet that you may see my soul hath fatherly care and desire after your spiritual and everlasting welfare, I now once again, as before, from the top of Shinir and Hermon, so now from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards, Song 4. 8. Do look yet after you all, greatly longing to see your safe arrival into the desired haven. I thank God upon every remembrance of you. And rejoice, even while I stick between the teeth of the lion in the wilderness, that the grace and mercy, and knowledge of Christ our Saviour, which God hath bestowed upon you, with abundance of faith and love. Your hungerings and thirstings after farther acquaintance with the Father, in the Son, your tenderness of heart, your trembling at sin, your sober and holy deportment also, before both God and men, is a great refreshment to me. For ye are our glory and joy. 1 Thess. 2. 20. I have sent you here enclosed, a drop of that honey that I have taken out of the carcass of a lion. Judges 14. 5-8. I have eaten thereof myself, and am much refreshed thereby. Temptations, when we meet them at first, are as the lion that roared upon Samson, but if we overcome them, the next time we see them, we shall find a nest of honey within them. The Philistines understand me not. It is something of a relation of the work of God upon my soul, even from the very first, till now, wherein you may perceive my castings down, and risings up, for he woundeth, and his hands make whole. It is written in the Scripture, Isa. 38. 19. The Father to the children shall make known thy truth. Yeah, it was for this reason I lay so long at Sinai, Leviticus 4. 10, 11, to see the fire, and the cloud, and the darkness, that I might fear the Lord all the days of my life upon earth, and tell of His wondrous works to my children. Psalm 78. 3-5. Moses, Num, 33. 1, 2, rid of the journeys of the children of Israel, from Egypt to the land of Canaan, and commanded also that they did remember their forty years' travel in the wilderness. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee, and to prove thee, and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments, or no. Deuteronomy 8. 2. Wherefore this I have endeavoured to do, and not only so, but to publish it also, that, if God will, others may be put in remembrance of what He hath done for their souls, by reading His work upon me. It is profitable for Christians to be often calling to mind the very beginnings of grace with their souls. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord, for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. Exodus 12. 42. O oh my God, Seth David, P.S. 42. 6. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan, and of the Hermonites, from the hill Mizar. He remembered also the lion and the bear, when he went to fight with the giant of Gath. 1 Sam, 17. 36, 37. It was Paul's accustomed manner, Acts 22, and that, when tried for his life, Acts 24, even to open before his judges the manner of his conversion, he would think of that day, and that hour, in which he first did meet with grace. For he found it supported him. When God had brought the children of Israel out of the Red Sea, far into the wilderness, yet they must turn quite about thither again, to remember the drowning of their enemies there, Num, 14. 25, For though they sang his praise before, yet they soon forgot his works. Psalm CVI. 11, 12. In this discourse of mine, you may see much, much I say, of the grace of God towards me, I thank God, I can count it much. For it was above my sins and Satan's temptations too. 
I can remember my fears and doubts, and sad months, with comfort. They are as the head of Goliath in my hand, there was nothing to David like Goliath's sword, even that sword that should have been sheathed in his bowels, for the very sight and remembrance of that did preach forth God's deliverance to him. Oh! The remembrance of my great sins, of my great temptations, and of my great fear of perishing for ever. They bring afresh into my mind, the remembrance of my great help, my great supports from heaven, and the great grace that God extended to such a wretch as I. My dear children, call to mind the former days, and years of ancient times, remember also your songs in the night, and commune with your own hearts, P.S. 73. 5-12. Yeah, look diligently, and leave no corner therein unsearched for that treasure hid, even the treasure of your first and second experience of the grace of God towards you. Remember, I say, the word that first laid hold upon you, remember your terrors of conscience, and fear of death and hell, remember also your tears and prayers to God, yeah, how you sighed under every hedge for mercy. Have you never a hill misar to remember? Have you forgot the close, the milk house, the stable, the barn, and the like, where God did visit your souls? Remember also the word, the word, I say, upon which the Lord hath caused you to hope, if you have sinned against light, if you are tempted to blaspheme, if you are drowned in despair, if you think God fights against you. Or if heaven is hid from your eyes. Remember it was thus with your father, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. I could have enlarged much in this my discourse, of my temptations and troubles for sin. As also of the merciful kindness and working of God with my soul, I could also have stepped into a style much higher than this, in which I have here discoursed, and could have adorned all things more than here I have seemed to do. But I dare not, God did not play in tempting of me. Neither did I play, when I sunk as into the bottomless pit, when the pangs of hell caught hold upon me, wherefore I may not play in relating of them, but be plain and simple, and lay down the thing as it was. He that liketh it, let him receive it, and he that doth not, let him produce a better. Farewell. My dear children. The milk and honey are beyond this wilderness. God be merciful to you, and grant that you be not slothful to go and to possess the land. John Bunyan. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit CompleteAudiobooks.com for more quality content. Grace abounding to the chief of sinners or, a brief relation of the exceeding mercy of God in Christ, to his poor servant, John Bunyan. In this my relation of the merciful working of God upon my soul, it will not be amiss, if in the first place. I do in a few words give you a hint of my pedigree, and manner of bringing up. That thereby the goodness and bounty of God towards me, may be the more advanced and magnified before the sons of men. 2. For my descent then, it was, as is well known by many, of a low and inconsiderable generation. My father's house being of that rank that is meanest, and most despised of all the families in the land. Wherefore, I have not here, as others, to boast of noble blood, or of any high-born state, according to the flesh. Though, all things considered, I magnify the heavenly majesty, for that by this door he brought me into the world, to partake of the grace and life that is in Christ by the gospel. 3. But yet, notwithstanding the meanness and inconsiderableness of my parents, it pleased God to put it into their hearts, to put me to school, to learn both to read and write. The which I also attained, according to the rate of other poor men's children, though, to my shame, I confess, I did soon lose that I had learned, even almost utterly. And that long before the Lord did work His gracious work of conversion upon my soul. For, as for my own natural life, for the time that I was without God in the world, it was, indeed, according to the course of this world and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. F2 2, 3 It was my delight to be taken captive by the devil at his will, 2 Tim, 2. 26 Being filled with all unrighteousness. The which did also so strongly work, and put forth itself, 
both in my heart and life, and that from a child, that I had but few equals, especially considering my years, which were tender, being but few, both for cursing, swearing, lying, and blaspheming the holy name of God. 5. Yeah, so settled and rooted was I in these things, that they became as a second nature to me. The which, as I have also with soberness considered since, did so offend the Lord, that even in my childhood he did scare and affrighten me with fearful dreams, and did terrify me with fearful visions. For often, after I have spent this and the other day in sin, I have in my bed been greatly afflicted, while asleep, with the apprehensions of devils and wicked spirits, who still, as I then thought, labored to draw me away with them. Of which I could never be rid. 6. Also I should, at these years, be greatly afflicted and troubled with the thoughts of the fearful torments of hellfire. Still fearing, that it would be my lot to be found at last among those devils and hellish fiends, who are there bound down with the chains and bonds of darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. 7. These things, I say, when I was but a child, but nine or ten years old, did so distress my soul, that then in the midst of my many sports and childish vanities, amidst my vain companions, I was often much cast down. And afflicted in my mind therewith, yet could I not let go my sins, yea, I was also then so overcome with despair of life and heaven, that I should often wish either that there had been no hell, or that I had been a devil. Supposing they were only tormentors, that if it must needs be, that I went thither, I might be rather a tormentor, than be tormented myself. 8. A while after those terrible dreams did leave me, which also I soon forgot. For my pleasures did quickly cut off the remembrance of them, as if they had never been, wherefore with more greediness, according to the strength of nature, I did still let loose the reins of my lust. And delighted in all transgressions against the law of God, so that until I came to the state of marriage, I was the very ringleader of all the youth that kept me company, in all manner of vice and ungodliness. 9. Yeah, such prevalency had the lusts and fruits of the flesh in this poor soul of mine, that had not a miracle of precious grace prevented, I had not only perished by the stroke of eternal justice, but had also laid myself open. Even to the stroke of those laws which bring some to disgrace and open shame before the face of the world. 10. In these days the thoughts of religion were very grievous to me, I could neither endure it myself, nor that any other should. So that when I have seen some read in those books that concerned Christian piety, it would be as it were a prison to me. Then I said unto God, Depart from me, for I desire not the knowledge of thy ways. Job 21. 14, 15. I was now void of all good consideration, heaven and hell were both out of sight and mind, and as for saving and damning, they were least in my thoughts. O Lord, Thou knowest my life, and my ways were not hid from Thee. 11. But this I well remember, that though I could myself sin with the greatest delight and ease, and also take pleasure in the vileness of my companions. Yet, even then, if I had at any time seen wicked things, by those who professed goodness, it would make my spirit tremble. As once above all the rest, when I was in the height of vanity, yet hearing one to swear, that was reckoned for a religious man, it had so great a stroke upon my spirit, that it made my heart ache. 12. But God did not utterly leave me, but followed me still, not now with convictions, but judgments, yet such as were mixed with mercy. For once I fell into a creek of the sea, and hardly escaped drowning. Another time I fell out of a boat into Bedford River, but, mercy yet preserved me alive, besides, another time, being in a field, with one of my companions, it chanced that an adder passed over the highway, so I having a stick in my hand, struck her over the back. And having stunned her, I forced open her mouth with my stick, and plucked her sting out with my fingers, by which act had not God been merciful unto me, I might by my desperateness, have brought myself to my end. 13. This also I have taken notice of, with thanksgiving, when I was a soldier, I with others, were drawn out to go to such a place to besiege it. But when I was just ready to go, one of the company desired to go in my room, to which, when I had consented, he took my place, and coming to the siege, as he stood sentinel, he was shot in the head with a musket bullet and died. 14. Here, as I said, 
were judgments and mercy, but neither of them did awaken my soul to righteousness, wherefore I sinned still, and grew more and more rebellious against God, and careless of my own salvation. 15. Presently after this, I changed my condition into a married state, and my mercy was, to light upon a wife whose father was counted godly, this woman and I. Though we came together as poor as poor might be, not having so much household stuff as a dish or a spoon betwixt us both, yet this she had for her part, the plain man's pathway to heaven and the practice of piety. Which her father had left her when he died. In these two books I would sometimes read with her, wherein I also found some things that were somewhat pleasing to me, but all this while I met with no conviction. She also would be often telling of me what a godly man her father was, and how he would reprove and correct vice, both in his house, and among his neighbors, what a strict and holy life he lived in his days, both in word and deed. 16. Wherefore these books, with this relation, though they did not reach my heart, to awaken it about my sad and sinful state, yet they did beget within me some desires to religion, so that because I knew no better. I fell in very eagerly with the religion of the times. To wit, to go to church twice a day, and that too with the foremost, and there should very devoutly, both say and sing, as others did, yet retaining my wicked life. But withal, I was so overrun with the spirit of superstition, that I adored, and that with great devotion, even all things, both the high place, priest, clerk, vestment, service, and what else, belonging to the church. Counting all things holy that were therein contained, and especially, the priest and clerk most happy, and without doubt, greatly blessed, because they were the servants, as I then thought, of God, and were principal in the holy temple. To do his work therein. 17. This conceit grew so strong in a little time upon my spirit, that had I but seen a priest, though never so sordid and debauched in his life, I should find my spirit fall under him, reverence him, and knit unto him. Yeah, I thought, for the love I did bear unto them, supposing them the ministers of God, I could have laid down at their feet, and have been trampled upon by them, their name, their garb, and work did so intoxicate and bewitch me. 18. After I had been thus for some considerable time, another thought came in my mind, and that was, whether we were of the Israelites or no. For finding in the scripture that they were once the peculiar people of God, thought I, if I were one of this race, my soul must needs be happy. Now again, I found within me a great longing to be resolved about this question, but could not tell how I should, at last I asked my father of it, who told me, no, we were not. Wherefore then I fell in my spirit, as to the hopes of that, and so remained. 19. But all this while, I was not sensible of the danger and evil of sin. I was kept from considering that sin would damn me, what religion soever I followed, unless I was found in Christ, nay, I never thought of him, or whether there was such a one, or no. Thus man, while blind, doth wander, but wearieth himself with vanity, for he knoweth not the way to the city of God. Ecclesiastes x 15. 20. But one day, amongst all the sermons our parson made, his subject was, to treat of the Sabbath day, and of the evil of breaking that, either with labor, sports, or otherwise. Now, I was, notwithstanding my religion, one that took much delight in all manner of vice, and especially that was the day that I did solace myself therewith wherefore I fell in my conscience under his sermon. Thinking and believing that he made that sermon on purpose to show me my evil doing. And at that time I felt what guilt was, though never before, that I can remember, but then I was, for the present, greatly loaden therewith, and so went home when the sermon was ended, with a great burthen upon my spirit. 21. This, for that instant did benumb the sinews of my best delights, and did embitter my former pleasures to me. But hold, it lasted not, for before I had well dined, the trouble began to go off my mind, and my heart returned to its old course, but oh! How glad was I, that this trouble was gone from me, and that the fire was put out, that I might sin again without control. Wherefore, when I had satisfied nature with my food, I shook the sermon out of my mind, and to my old custom of sports and gaming, I returned with great delight. 22. But the same day, as I was in the midst of a game of cat, 
and having struck it one blow from the hole, just as I was about to strike it the second time, a voice did suddenly dart from heaven into my soul, which said. Wilt thou leave thy sins and go to heaven, or have thy sins and go to hell? At this I was put to an exceeding maze. Wherefore leaving my cat upon the ground, I looked up to heaven, and was, as if I had, with the eyes of my understanding, seen the Lord Jesus looking down upon me, as being very hotly displeased with me. And as if he did severely threaten me with some grievous punishment for these and other ungodly practices. 23. I had no sooner thus conceived in my mind, but, suddenly, this conclusion was fastened on my spirit, for the former hint did set my sins again before my face, that I had been a great and grievous sinner. And that it was now too late for me to look after heaven. For Christ would not forgive me, nor pardon my transgressions. Then I fell to musing on this also, and while I was thinking of it, and fearing lest it should be so, I felt my heart sink in despair, concluding it was too late. And therefore I resolved in my mind I would go on in sin, for, thought I, if the case be thus, my state is surely miserable, miserable if I leave my sins, and but miserable if I follow them. I can but be damned, and if I must be so, I had as good be damned for many sins, as be damned for few. 24. Thus I stood in the midst of my play, before all that then were present, but yet I told them nothing, but I say. Having made this conclusion, I returned desperately to my sport again, and I well remember, that presently this kind of despair did so possess my soul, that I was persuaded I could never attain to other comfort than what I should get in sin. For heaven was gone already, so that on that I must not think, wherefore I found within me great desire to take my fill of sin, still studying what sin was yet to be committed, that I might taste the sweetness of it. And I made as much haste as I could to fill my belly with its delicates, lest I should die before I had my desire, for that I feared greatly. In these things, I protest before God, I lie not, neither do I feign this form of speech. These were really, strongly, and with all my heart, my desires, the good Lord, whose mercy is unsearchable, forgive me my transgressions. 25. And I am very confident, that this temptation of the devil is more usual among poor creatures, than many are aware of, even to overrun the spirits with a scurvy in seared frame of heart, and benumbing of conscience. Which frame he stilly and slyly supplieth with such despair, that, though not much guilt attendeth souls, yet they continually have a secret conclusion within them, that there is no hope for them. For they have loved sins, therefore after them they will go. J2. 25, and 18. 12. 26. Now therefore I went on in sin with great greediness of mind, still grudging that I could not be so satisfied with it, as I would. This did continue with me about a month, or more, but one day, as I was standing at a neighbor's shop window, and there cursing and swearing, and playing the madman, after my wonted manner, there sate within, the woman of the house, and heard me. Who, though she also was a very loose and ungodly wretch, yet protested that I swore and cursed at that most fearful rate, that she was made to tremble to hear me. And told me further, that I was the ungodliest fellow for swearing, that she ever heard in all her life, and that I, by thus doing, was able to spoil all the youth in the whole town, if they come but in my company. 27. At this reproof I was silenced, and put to secret shame, and that too, as I thought, before the God of heaven. Wherefore, while I stood there, and hanging down my head, I wished with all my heart that I might be a little child again, that my father might learn me to speak without this wicked way of swearing. For, thought I, I am so accustomed to it, that it is in vain for me to think of a reformation, for I thought it could never be. 28. But how it came to pass, I know not. I did from this time forward, so leave my swearing, that it was a great wonder to myself to observe it, and whereas before I knew not how to speak unless I put an oath before, and another behind, to make my words have authority. Now I could, without it, speak better, and with more pleasantness than ever I could before. All this while I knew not Jesus Christ, neither did I leave my sports and plays. 29. But quickly after this, I fell into company with one poor man that made profession of religion, who, as I then thought, 
did talk pleasantly of the scriptures, and of the matters of religion. Wherefore falling into some love and liking to what he said, I betook me to my Bible, and began to take great pleasure in reading, but especially with the historical part thereof. For as for Paul's epistles, and such like scriptures, I could not away with them, being as yet ignorant, either of the corruptions of my nature, or of the want and worth of Jesus Christ to save me. 30. Wherefore I fell to some outward reformation both in my words and life, and did set the commandments before me for my way to heaven. Which commandments I also did strive to keep, and, as I thought, did keep them pretty well sometimes, and then I should have comfort, yet now and then should break one, and so afflict my conscience. But then I should repent, and say, I was sorry for it, and promise God to do better next time, and there get help again, for then I thought I pleased God as well as any man in England. 31 Thus I continued about a year. All which time our neighbours did take me to be a very godly man, a new and religious man, and did marvel much to see such a great and famous alteration in my life and manners. And indeed so it was, though yet I knew not Christ, nor grace, nor faith, nor hope, for, as I have well seen since, had I then died, my state had been most fearful. 32. But, I say, my neighbours were amazed at this my great conversion, from prodigious profaneness, to something like a moral life, and truly, so they well might, for this my conversion was as great, as for Tom of Bethlehem to become a sober man. Now therefore they began to praise, to commend, and to speak well of me, both to my face, and behind my back. Now I was, as they said, become godly, now I was become a right honest man. But oh! When I understood these were their words and opinions of me, it pleased me mighty well. For, though as yet I was nothing but a poor painted hypocrite, yet, I loved to be talked of as one that was truly godly. I was proud of my godliness, and indeed, I did all I did, either to be seen of, or to be well spoken of, by men, and thus I continued for about a twelvemonth, or more. 33. Now you must know, that, before this, I had taken much delight in ringing, but my conscience beginning to be tender, I thought such practice was but vain, and therefore forced myself to leave it, yet my mind hankered. Wherefore I would go to the steeple house, and look on, though I durst not ring, but I thought this did not become religion neither. Yet I forced myself, and would look on still, but quickly after, I began to think, how if one of the bells should fall. Then I chose to stand under a main beam, that lay over thwart the steeple, from side to side, thinking here I might stand sure. But then I should think again, should the bell fall with a swing, it might first hit the wall, and then, rebounding upon me, might kill me for all this beam, this made me stand in the steeple door, and now, thought I, I am safe enough. For if the bell should now fall, I can slip out behind these thick walls, and so be preserved notwithstanding. 34. So after this I would yet go to see them ring, but would not go any farther than the steeple door. But then it came into my head, how if the steeple itself should fall. And this thought, it may for aught I know, when I stood and looked on, did continually so shake my mind, that I durst not stand at the steeple door any longer, but was forced to flee, for fear the steeple should fall upon my head. 35. Another thing was, my dancing, I was a full year before I could quite leave that. But all this while, when I thought I kept this or that commandment, or did, by word or deed, anything that I thought was good, I had great peace in my conscience, and should think with myself, God cannot choose but be now pleased with me. Yeah, to relate it in mine own way, I thought no man in England could please God better than I. 36. But poor wretch as I was. I was all this while ignorant of Jesus Christ. And going about to establish my own righteousness. And had perished therein, had not God in mercy showed me more of my state by nature. 37. But upon a day, the good providence of God called me to Bedford, to work on my calling. And in one of the streets of that town, I came where there were three or four poor women sitting at a door, in the sun, talking about the things of God. And being now willing to hear them discourse, I drew near to hear what they said, for I was now a brisk talker also myself, in the matters of religion, 
but I may say, I heard but understood not, for they were far above, out of my reach. Their talk was about a new birth, the work of God on their hearts, also how they were convinced of their miserable state by nature. They talked how God had visited their souls with His love in the Lord Jesus, and with what words and promises they had been refreshed, comforted, and supported, against the temptations of the devil, moreover. They reasoned of the suggestions and temptations of Satan in particular. And told to each other, by which they had been afflicted and how they were borne up under his assaults. They also discoursed of their own wretchedness of heart, and of their unbelief. And did contemn, slight and abhor their own righteousness, as filthy, and insufficient to do them any good. 38. And, methought, they spake as if joy did make them speak. They spake with such pleasantness of scripture language, and with such appearance of grace in all they said, that they were to me, as if they had found a new world. As if they were people that dwelt alone, and were not to be reckoned among their neighbors. Num, 23. 9. 39. At this I felt my own heart began to shake, and mistrust my condition to be naught. For I saw that in all my thoughts about religion and salvation, the new birth did never enter into my mind, neither knew I the comfort of the word and promise, nor the deceitfulness and treachery of my own wicked heart. As for secret thoughts, I took no notice of them, neither did I understand what Satan's temptations were, nor how they were to be withstood, and resisted, etc. 40. Thus, therefore, when I had heard and considered what they said, I left them, and went about my employment again, but their talk and discourse went with me. Also my heart would tarry with them, for I was greatly affected with their words, both because by them I was convinced that I wanted the true tokens of a truly godly man. And also because by them I was convinced of the happy and blessed condition of him that was such a one. 41. Therefore I should often make it my business to be going again and again into the company of these poor people, for I could not stay away, and the more I went amongst them, the more I did question my condition. And as I still do remember, presently I found two things within me, at which I did sometimes marvel, especially considering what a blind, ignorant, sordid and ungodly wretch but just before I was. The one was a very great softness and tenderness of heart, which caused me to fall under the conviction of what by scripture they asserted, and the other was a great bending in my mind, to a continual meditating on it, and on all other good things. Which at any time I heard or read of. 42. By these things my mind was now so turned, that it lay like an horse leech at the vein, still crying out, Give, give, pearl v triple x. 15. Yeah, it was so fixed on eternity, and on the things about the kingdom of heaven, that is, so far as I knew, though as yet, God knows, I knew but little, that neither pleasures, nor profits, nor persuasions, nor threats, could loose it. Or make it let go its hold. And though I may speak it with shame, yet it is in very deed, a certain truth, it would then have been as difficult for me to have taken my mind from heaven to earth, as I have found it often since, to get again from earth to heaven. 43. One thing I may not omit, there was a young man in our town, to whom my heart before was knit, more than to any other, but he being a most wicked creature for cursing, and swearing, and whoring, I now shook him off, and forsook his company. But about a quarter of a year after I had left him, I met him in a certain lane, and asked him how he did, he, after his old swearing and mad way, answered, he was well. But, Harry, said I, why do you curse and swear thus? What will become of you, if you die in this condition? He answered me in a great chafe, what would the devil do for company, if it were not for such as I am? 44. About this time I met with some ranters' books, that were put forth by some of our countrymen, which books were also highly in esteem by several old professors, some of these I read, but was not able to make any judgment about them. Wherefore as I read in them, and thought upon them, seeing myself unable to judge, I would betake myself to hearty prayer in this manner. O Lord, I am a fool, and not able to know the truth from error, Lord, leave me not to my own blindness, either to approve of or condemn this doctrine, if it be of God, let me not despise it, if it be of the devil, let me not embrace it. Lord, I lay my soul in this matter only at thy foot, let me not be deceived, I humbly beseech thee. 
I had one religious intimate companion all this while, and that was the poor man I spoke of before. But about this time, he also turned a most devilish ranter, and gave himself up to all manner of filthiness, especially uncleanness, he would also deny that there was a god, angel, or spirit, and would laugh at all exhortations to sobriety. When I labored to rebuke his wickedness he would laugh the more, and pretend that he had gone through all religions, and could never light on the right till now. He told me also, that in a little time I should see all professors turn to the ways of the ranters. Wherefore, abominating those cursed principles, I left his company forthwith, and became to him as great a stranger, as I had been before a familiar. 45. Neither was this man only a temptation to me, but my calling lying in the country, I happened to light into several people's company, who though strict in religion formerly, yet were also swept away by these ranters. These would also talk with me of their ways, and condemn me as legal and dark, pretending that they only had attained to perfection, that could do what they would and not sin. Oh! These temptations were suitable to my flesh, I being but a young man and my nature in its prime, but God, who had, as I hoped, designed me for better things, kept me in the fear of His name, and did not suffer me to accept such cursed principles. And blessed be God, who put it into my heart to cry to Him to be kept and directed, still distrusting my own wisdom. For I have since seen even the effects of that prayer, in His preserving me, not only from ranting errors, but from those also that have sprung up since. The Bible was precious to me in those days. 46. And now methought, I began to look into the Bible with new eyes, and read as I never did before, and especially the epistles of the Apostle St. Paul were sweet and pleasant to me. And indeed I was then never out of the Bible either by reading or meditation, still crying out to God, that I might know the truth, and way to heaven and glory. 47. And as I went on and read, I lighted upon that passage, to one is given, by the Spirit, the word of wisdom, to another the word knowledge by the same Spirit, and to another faith, etc. 1 Cor 12. And though, as I have since seen, that by this scripture the Holy Ghost intends, in special, things extraordinary, yet on me it did then fasten with conviction, that I did want things ordinary. Even that understanding and wisdom that other Christians had. On this word I mused, and could not tell what to do, especially this word, faith, put me to it, for I could not help it, but sometimes must question, whether I had any faith, or no, but I was loath to conclude, I had no faith. For if I do so, thought I, then I shall count myself a very castaway indeed. 48, No, said I, with myself, though I am convinced that I am an ignorant sot, and that I want those blessed gifts of knowledge and understanding that other people have. Yet at a venture I will conclude, I am not altogether faithless, though I know not what faith is. For it was shown me, and that too, as I have seen since, by Satan, that those who conclude themselves in a faithless state, have neither rest nor quiet in their souls, and I was loath to fall quite into despair. 49. Wherefore by this suggestion I was, for a while, made afraid to see my want of faith. But God would not suffer me thus to undo and destroy my soul, but did continually, against this my sad and blind conclusion, create still within me such suppositions, insomuch that I could not rest content. Until I did now come to some certain knowledge, whether I had faith or no, this always running in my mind, but how if you want faith indeed? But how can you tell you have faith? And besides, I saw for certain, if I had not, I was sure to perish for ever. 50. So that though I endeavoured at the first to look over the business of faith, yet in a little time, I better considering the matter, was willing to put myself upon the trial whether I had faith or no. But alas, poor wretch! So ignorant and brutish was I, that I knew not to this day no more how to do it, than I know how to begin and accomplish that rare and curious piece of art, which I never yet saw or considered. 51. Wherefore while I was thus considering, and being put to my plunge about it, for you must know, that as yet I had in this matter broken my mind to no man, only did hear and consider, the tempter came in with this delusion. That there was no way for me to know I had faith, but by trying to work some miracle. 
urging those scriptures that seem to look that way, for the enforcing and strengthening his temptation. Nay, one day, as I was between Elstone Bedford, the temptation was hot upon me, to try if I had faith, by doing some miracle. Which miracle at this time was this, I must say to the puddles that were in the horse pads, be dry, and to the dry places, be you puddles, and truly one time I was going to say so indeed. But just as I was about to speak, this thought came into my mind, but go under yonder hedge and pray first, that God would make you able. But when I had concluded to pray, this came hot upon me. That if I prayed, and came again and tried to do it, and yet did nothing notwithstanding, then to be sure I had no faith, but was a castaway, and lost, nay, thought I, if it be so, I will not try yet, but will stay a little longer. 52. So I continued at a great loss, for I thought, if they only had faith, which could do so wonderful things, then I concluded, that for the present I neither had it, nor yet for the time to come, were ever like to have it. Thus I was tossed betwixt the devil and my own ignorance, and so perplexed, especially at some times, that I could not tell what to do. 53. About this time, the state and happiness of these poor people at Bedford was thus, in a kind of a vision, presented to me, I saw as if they were on the sunny side of some high mountain. There refreshing themselves with the pleasant beams of the sun, while I was shivering and shrinking in the cold, afflicted with frost, snow and dark clouds, methought also, betwixt me and them, I saw a wall that did compass about this mountain. Now through this wall my soul did greatly desire to pass. Concluding, that if I could, I would even go into the very midst of them, and there also comfort myself with the heat of their sun. 54. About this wall I bethought myself, to go again and again, still prying as I went, to see if I could find some way or passage, by which I might enter therein, but none could I find for some time, at the last, I saw, as it were, a narrow gap. Like a little doorway in the wall, through which I attempted to pass, now the passage being very straight and narrow, I made many offers to get in, but all in vain, even until I was well nigh quite beat out, by striving to get in. At last, with great striving, methought I at first did get in my head, and after that, by a sidling striving, my shoulders, and my whole body. Then I was exceeding glad, went and sat down in the midst of them, and so was comforted with the light and heat of their sun. 55. Now this mountain, and wall, etc. Was thus made out to me, the mountain signified the church of the living God, the sun that shone thereon, the comfortable shining of his merciful face on them that were therein. The wall I thought was the word, that did make separation between the Christians and the world, and the gap which was in the wall, I thought, was Jesus Christ, who is the way to God the Father. John 14. 6, Matt, 7. 14. But forasmuch as the passage was wonderful narrow, even so narrow that I could not, but with great difficulty, enter in thereat, it showed me, that none could enter into life, but those that were in downright earnest. And unless also they left that wicked world behind them. For here was only room for body and soul, but not for body and soul and sin. 56. This resemblance abode upon my spirit many days. All which time I saw myself in a forlorn and sad condition, but yet was provoked to a vehement hunger and desire to be one of that number that did sit in the sunshine, now also I should pray wherever I was, whether at home or abroad. In house or field, and would also often, with lifting up of heart, sing that of the fifty-first psalm, O Lord, consider my distress, for as yet I knew not where I was. 57. Neither as yet could I attain to any comfortable persuasion that I had faith in Christ, but instead of having satisfaction here, I began to find my soul to be assaulted with fresh doubts about my future happiness. Especially with such as these, whether I was elected? But how, if the day of grace should now be past and gone? 58. By these two temptations I was very much afflicted and disquieted, sometimes by one, and sometimes by the other of them. And first, to speak of that about my questioning my election, I found at this time, that though I was in a flame to find the way to heaven and glory, and though nothing could beat me off from this, yet this question did so offend and discourage me. 
That I was, especially sometimes, as if the very strength of my body also had been taken away by the force and power thereof. This scripture did also seem to me to trample upon all my desires, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Rom 9. 16. 59. With this scripture I could not tell what to do, for I evidently saw, unless that the great God, of his infinite grace and bounty, had voluntarily chosen me to be a vessel of mercy, though I should desire, and long and labor until my heart did break, no good could come of it. Therefore this would stick with me, how can you tell that you are elected? And what if you should not? How then? 60, O Lord, thought I, what if I should not indeed? It may be you are not, said the tempter, it may be so indeed, thought I. Why then, said Satan, you had as good leave off, and strive no farther, for if indeed, you should not be elected and chosen of God, there is no talk of your being saved, for it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth. But of God that showeth mercy. 61. By these things I was driven to my wit's end, not knowing what to say, or how to answer these temptations, indeed, I little thought that Satan had thus assaulted me. But that rather it was my own prudence thus to start the question for that the elect only attained eternal life that, I without scruple did heartily close with all, but that myself was one of them, there lay the question. 62. Thus therefore, for several days, I was greatly assaulted and perplexed, and was often, when I have been walking, ready to sink where I went, with faintness in my mind. But one day, after I had been so many weeks oppressed and cast down therewith as I was now quite giving up the ghost of all my hopes of ever attaining life, that sentence fell with weight upon my spirit, look at the generations of old, and see. Did ever any trust in God, and were confounded? 63, at which I was greatly lightened, and encouraged in my soul. For thus, at that very instant, it was expounded to me, begin at the beginning of Genesis, and read to the end of the Revelations, and see if you can find, that there were ever any that trusted in the Lord, and were confounded. So coming home, I presently went to my Bible, to see if I could find that saying, not doubting but to find it presently, for it was so fresh, and with such strength and comfort on my spirit, that it was as if it talked with me. 64. Well, I looked, but I found it not, only it abode upon me, then did I ask first this good man, and then another, if they knew where it was, but they knew no such place. At this I wondered, that such a sentence should so suddenly, and with such comfort and strength, seize, and abide upon my heart, and yet that none could find it, for I doubted not but that it was in Holy Scripture. 65. Thus I continued above a year, and could not find the place, but at last, casting my eye upon the Apocrypha books, I found it in Ecclesiasticus, Ecclesiastes 2. 10. This, at the first, did somewhat daunt me. But because by this time I had got more experience of the love and kindness of God, it troubled me the less, especially when I considered that though it was not in those texts that we call holy and canonical. Yet forasmuch as this sentence was the sum and substance of many of the promises, it was my duty to take the comfort of it, and I bless God for that word, for it was of God to me, that word doth still at times shine before my face. 66. After this, that other doubt did come with strength upon me, but how if the day of grace should be past and gone? How if you have overstood the time of mercy? Now I remember that one day, as I was walking in the country, I was much in the thoughts of this, but how if the day of grace is past? And to aggravate my trouble, the tempter presented to my mind those good people of Bedford, and suggested thus unto me, that these being converted already, they were all that God would save in those parts. And that I came too late, for these had got the blessing before I came. 67. Now I was in great distress, thinking in very deed that this might well be so, wherefore I went up and down, bemoaning my sad condition. Counting myself far worse than a thousand fools for standing off thus long, and spending so many years in sin as I had done, still crying out, Oh! That I had turned sooner! Oh! That I had turned seven years ago! It made me also angry with myself, to think that I should have no more wit, 
but to trifle away my time, till my soul and heaven were lost. 68. But when I had been long vexed with this fear, and was scarce able to take one step more, just about the same place where I received my other encouragement, these words broke in upon my mind, compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. And yet there is room. Luke 14. 22, 23. These words, but especially those, and yet there is room, were sweet words to me, for truly I thought that by them I saw there was place enough in heaven for me. And moreover, that when the Lord Jesus did speak these words, he then did think of me, and that he knowing that the time would come, that I should be afflicted with fear, that there was no place left for me in his bosom, did before speak this word. And leave it upon record, that I might find help thereby against this vile temptation. This I then verily believed. 69. In the light and encouragement of this word I went a pretty while. And the comfort was the more, when I thought that the Lord Jesus should think on me so long ago, and that he should speak those words on purpose for my sake, for I did think verily, that he did on purpose speak them to encourage me withal. 70. But I was not without my temptations to go back again, temptations I say, both from Satan, mine own heart, and carnal acquaintance. But I thank God these were outweighed by that sound sense of death, and of the day of judgment, which abode, as it were, continually in my view, I would often also think on Nebuchadnezzar. Of whom it is said, he had given him all the kingdoms of the earth. Dan v. 18, 19. Yet, thought I, if this great man had all his portion in this world, one hour in hellfire would make him forget all. Which consideration was a great help to me. 71. I was also made, about this time, to see something concerning the beasts that Moses counted clean and unclean, I thought those beasts were types of men, the clean, types of them that were the people of God. But the unclean, types of such as were the children of the wicked one. Now I read, that the clean beasts chewed the cud, that is, thought I, they show us, we must feed upon the word of God, they also parted the hoof. I thought that signified, we must part, if we would be saved, with the ways of ungodly men. And also, in further reading about them, I found, that though we did chew the cud, as the hare, yet if we walked with claws, like a dog. Or if we did part the hoof, like the swine, yet if we did not chew the cud, as the sheep, we were still, for all that, but unclean, for I thought the hare to be a type of those that talk of the word, yet walk in the ways of sin. And that the swine was like him that parted with his outward pollutions, but still wanted the word of faith, without which there could be no way of salvation, let a man be never so devout. Deuteronomy 14. After this, I found by reading the word, that those that must be glorified with Christ in another world must be called by him here. Called to the partaking of a share in his word and righteousness, and to the comforts and first fruits of his spirit. And to a peculiar interest in all those heavenly things, which do indeed prepare the soul for that rest, and house of glory, which is in heaven above. 72. Here again I was at a very I great stand, not knowing what to do, fearing I was not called. For, thought I, if I be not called, what then can do me good? None but those who are effectually called inherit the kingdom of heaven. But oh! How I now loved those words that spake of a Christian's calling. As when the Lord said to one, Follow me, and to another, Come after me, and oh, thought I, that he would say so to me too, how gladly would I run after him. 73. I cannot now express with what longings and breathings in my soul, I cried to Christ to call me. Thus I continued for a time, all on a flame to be converted to Jesus Christ. And did also see at that day, such glory in a converted state, that I could not be contented without a share therein. Gold. Could it have been gotten for gold, what would I have given for it? Had I had a whole world, it had all gone ten thousand times over for this, that my soul might have been in a converted state. 74. How lovely now was every one in my eyes, that I thought to be converted men and women. They shone, they walked like a people that carried the broad seal of heaven about them. Oh! I saw the lot was fallen to them in pleasant places, and they had a goodly heritage. 
Psalm 16. But that which made me sick, was that of Christ, in St. Mark, he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. Mark 3. 13. 75. This scripture made me faint and fear, yet it kindled fire in my soul. That which made me fear, was this, lest Christ should have no liking to me, for he called whom he would. But oh! The glory that I saw in that condition, did still so engage my heart, that I could seldom read of any that Christ did call, but I presently wished, would I had been in their clothes, would I had been born Peter, would I had been born John. Or, would I had been by and had heard him when he called them, how would I have cried, O Lord, call me also. But, oh! I feared he would not call me. 76 And truly, the Lord let me go thus many months together, and shewed me nothing. Either that I was already, or should be called hereafter, but at last after much time spent, and many groans to God, that I might be made partaker of the holy and heavenly calling. That word came in upon me, I will cleanse their blood, that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. Joel 3. 21 These words I thought were sent to encourage me to wait still upon God. And signified unto me, that if I were not already, yet time might come, I might be in truth converted unto Christ. 77 About this time I began to break my mind to those poor people in Bedford, and to tell them my condition. Which when they had heard, they told Mr. Gifford of me, who himself also took occasion to talk with me, and was willing to be well persuaded of me, though I think from little grounds, but he invited me to his house. Where I should hear him confer with others, about the dealings of God with their souls. From all which I still received more conviction, and from that time began to see something of the vanity and inward wretchedness of my wicked heart, for as yet I knew no great matter therein. But now it began to be discovered unto me, and also to work at that rate as it never did before. Now I evidently found, that lusts and corruptions put forth themselves within me, in wicked thoughts and desires, which I did not regard before. My desires also for heaven and life began to fail, I found also, that whereas before my soul was full of longing after God, now it began to hanker after every foolish vanity, yea, my heart would not be moved to mind that which was good. It began to be careless, both of my soul and heaven, it would now continually hang back, both to, and in every duty, and was as a clog on the leg of a bird, to hinder me from flying. 78. Nay, thought I, now I grow worse and worse, now I am farther from conversion than ever I was before. Wherefore I began to sink greatly in my soul, and began to entertain such discouragement in my heart, as laid me as low as hell. If now I should have burned at the stake, I could not believe that Christ had love for me, alas! I could neither hear him, nor see him, nor feel him, nor favor any of his things. I was driven as with a tempest, my heart would be unclean, and the Canaanites would dwell in the land. 79. Sometimes I would tell my condition to the people of God, which, when they heard, they would pity me, and would tell me of the promises. But they had as good have told me, that I must reach the sun with my finger, as have bidden me receive or rely upon the promises, and as soon I should have done it. All my sense and feeling were against me. And I saw I had an heart that would sin, and that lay under a law that would condemn. 80. These things have often made me think of the child which the father brought to Christ, who, while he was yet coming to him, was thrown down by the devil, and also so rent and torn by him, that he lay down and wallowed, foaming. Luke 9. 42. Mark 9. 20. 81. Further, in these days, I would find my heart to shut itself up against the Lord, and against His holy word, I have found my unbelief to set, as it were, the shoulder to the door, to keep Him out. And that too even then, when I have with many a bitter sigh, cried, Good Lord, break it open, Lord, break these gates of brass, and cut these bars of iron asunder. Psalm Kvi. 16. Yet that word would sometimes create in my heart a peaceable pause, I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Isaiah XLV. 5. 82. But all this while, 
As to the act of sinning, I was never more tender than now, my hinder parts were inward, I durst not take a pin or stick, though but so big as a straw. For my conscience now was sore, and would smart at every touch, I could not now tell how to speak my words, for fear I should misplace them. Oh, how gingerly did I then go, in all I did or said. I found myself as on a miry bog, that shook if I did but stir, and was, as there, left both of God and Christ, and the Spirit, and all good things. 83. But I observed, though I was such a great sinner before conversion, yet God never much charged the guilt of the sins of my ignorance upon me. Only He showed me, I was lost if I had not Christ, because I had been a sinner, I saw that I wanted a perfect righteousness to present me without fault before God, and this righteousness was nowhere to be found, but in the person of Jesus Christ. 84. But my original and inward pollution, that, that was my plague and affliction, that I saw at a dreadful rate, always putting forth itself within me, that I had the guilt of, to amazement. By reason of that, I was more loathsome in mine own eyes than was a toad, and I thought I was so in God's eyes too, sin and corruption, I said, would as naturally bubble out of my heart, as water would bubble out of a fountain, I thought now. That every one had a better heart than I had. I could have changed heart with any body, I thought none but the devil himself could equalize me for inward wickedness and pollution of mind. I fell therefore at the sight of my own vileness deeply into despair. For I concluded, that this condition that I was in, could not stand with a state of grace. Sure, thought I, I am forsaken of God. Sure, I am given up to the devil, and to a reprobate mind, and thus I continued a long while, even for some years together. 85. While I was thus afflicted with the fears of my own damnation, there were two things would make me wonder. The one was, when I saw old people hunting after the things of this life, as if they should live here always, the other was, when I found professors much distressed and cast down, when they met with outward losses, as of husband, wife, child, etc. Lord, thought I, what a do is here about such little things as these? What seeking after carnal things, by some, and what grief in others for the loss of them? If they so much labor after, and shed so many tears for the things of this present life, how am I to be bemoaned, pitied, and prayed for? My soul is dying, my soul is damning. Were my soul but in a good condition, and were I but sure of it, ah! How rich should I esteem myself, though blessed but with bread and water! I should count those but small afflictions, and should bear them as little burthens. A wounded spirit who can bear! 86. And though I was much troubled, and tossed, and afflicted, with the sight and sense and terror of my own wickedness, yet I was afraid to let this sight and sense go quite off my mind, that unless guilt of conscience was taken off the right way. That is, by the blood of Christ a man grew rather worse for the loss of his trouble of mind, than better. Wherefore, if my guilt lay hard upon me, then I should cry that the blood of Christ might take it off, and if it was going off without it, for the sense of sin would be sometimes as if it would die, and go quite away. Then I would also strive to fetch it upon my heart again, by bringing the punishment of sin in hell fire upon my spirit. And should cry, Lord, let it not go off my heart, but the right way, by the blood of Christ, and the application of thy mercy, through him, to my soul, for that scripture lay much upon me, without shedding of blood is no remission. Heb 9. 22. And that which made me the more afraid of this, was, because I had seen some, who though when they were under wounds of conscience, would cry and pray. Yet seeking rather present ease from their trouble, than pardon for their sin, cared not how they lost their guilt, so they got it out of their mind, now, having got it off the wrong way, it was not sanctified unto them. But they grew harder and blinder, and more wicked after their trouble. This made me afraid, and made me cry to God the more, that it might not be so with me. 87. And now I was sorry that God had made me man, for I feared I was a reprobate. I counted man as unconverted, the most doleful of all the creatures. Thus being afflicted and tossed about my sad condition, I counted myself alone, and above the most of men unblessed. 88. 
Yeah, I thought it impossible that ever I should attain to so much goodness of heart, as to thank God that he had made me a man. Man indeed is the most noble by creation, of all creatures in the visible world. But by sin he has made himself the most ignoble. The beasts, birds, fishes, etc. I blessed their condition, for they had not a sinful nature, they were not obnoxious to the wrath of God, they were not to go to hell fire after death. I could therefore have rejoiced, had my condition been as any of theirs. 89. In this condition I went a great while, but when comforting time was come, I heard one preach a sermon on these words in the song, Song 4. 1. Behold, thou art fair, my love, behold, thou art fair. But at that time he made these two words, my love, his chief and subject matter, from which, after he had a little opened the text, he observed these several conclusions. 1. That the church, and so every saved soul, is Christ's love, when loveless. 2. Christ's love without a cause. 3. Christ's love, when hated of the world. 4. Christ's love, when under temptation and under destruction. 5. Christ's love, from first to last. 90. But I got nothing by what he said at present, only when he came to the application of the fourth particular, this was the word he said. If it be so, that the saved soul is Christ's love, when under temptation and desertion, then poor tempted soul, when thou art assaulted, and afflicted with temptations, and the hidings of God's face, yet think on these two words, my love, still. 91. So as I was going home, these words came again into my thoughts, and I well remember, as they came in, I said thus in my heart, what shall I get by thinking on these two words? This thought had no sooner passed through my heart, but these words began thus to kindle in my spirit, Thou art my love, thou art my dove, twenty times together. And still as they ran in my mind, they waxed stronger and warmer, and began to make me look up, but being as yet, between hope and fear, I still replied in my heart, But is it true, but is it true? At which that sentence fell upon me, he wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel. Acts 12. 9. 92. Then I began to give place to the word which with power, did over and over make this joyful sound within my soul, Thou art my love, thou art my love, and nothing shall separate thee from my love. And with that my heart was filled full of comfort and hope, and now I could believe that my sins should be forgiven me. Yeah, I was now so taken with the love and mercy of God, that I remember I could not tell how to contain till I got home, I thought I could have spoken of His love, and have told of His mercy to me, even to the very crows. That sat upon the ploughed lands before me, had they been capable to have understood me, wherefore I said in my soul, with much gladness, well, I would I had a pen and ink here, I would write this down before I go any farther. For surely I will not forget this forty years hence. But, alas! Within less than forty days I began to question all again, which made me begin to question all still. 93. Yet still at times I was helped to believe, that it was a true manifestation of grace unto my soul, though I had lost much of the life and favour of it. Now about a week or a fortnight after this I was much followed by this scripture, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, Luke 22. 31 And sometimes it would sound so loud within me, yeah, and as it was, call so strongly after me, that once, above all the rest, I turned my head over my shoulder, thinking verily that some man had behind me, called me. Being at a great distance, methought he called so loud, it came, as I have thought since, to have stirred me up to prayer, and to watchfulness, it came to acquaint me, that a cloud and a storm was coming down upon me, but I understood it not. 94. Also, as I remember, that time that it called to me so loud, was the last time that it sounded in mine ears, but methinks I hear still with what a loud voice these words, Simon, Simon, sounded in mine ears. I thought verily, as I have told you, that somebody had called after me, that was half a mile behind me, and although that was not my name, yet it made me suddenly look behind me, believing that he that called so loud, meant me. 95. But so foolish was I, and ignorant, that I knew not the reason of this sound. 
which as I did both see and feel soon after, was sent from heaven as an alarm, to awaken me to provide for what was coming, only I should muse and wonder in my mind, to think what should be the reason of this scripture, and that at this rate. So often and so loud, should still be sounding and rattling in mine ears, but, as I said before, I soon after perceived the end of God therein. 96. 4. About the space of a month after, a very great storm came down upon me, which handled me twenty times worse than all I had met with before. It came stealing upon me, now by one piece, then by another, first, all my comfort was taken from me, then darkness seized upon me. After which, whole floods of blasphemies, both against God, Christ, and the Scriptures, were poured upon my spirit, to my great confusion and astonishment. These blasphemous thoughts were such as stirred up questions in me against the very being of God, and of His only beloved Son, as, whether there were in truth, a God or Christ. And whether the Holy Scriptures were not rather a fable, and cunning story, than the holy and pure Word of God. 97. The tempter would also much assault me with this, how can you tell but that the Turks had as good scriptures to prove their Muhammad the Saviour, as we have to prove our Jesus is? And, could I think, that so many ten thousands, in so many countries and kingdoms, should be without the knowledge of the right way to heaven, if there were indeed a heaven? And that we only, who live in a corner of the earth, should alone be blessed therewith? Every one doth think his own religion rightest, both Jews and Moors, and pagans. And how if all our faith, and Christ, and scriptures, should be but a think so too? 98. Sometimes I have endeavoured to argue against these suggestions, and to set some of the sentences of blessed Paul against them, but alas! I quickly felt, when I thus did, such arguings as these would return again upon me, though we made so great a matter of Paul, and of his words, yet how could I tell, but that in very deed, he being a subtle and cunning man, might give himself up to deceive with strong delusions, and also take the pains and travel, to undo and destroy his fellows. 99. These suggestions, with many others which at this time I may not, and dare not utter, neither by word or pen, did make such a seizure upon my spirit, and did so overweigh my heart, both with their number, continuance, and fiery force. That I felt as if there were nothing else but these from morning to night within me. And as though indeed there could be room for nothing else, and also concluded, that God had, in very wrath to my soul, given me up to them, to be carried away with them, as with a mighty whirlwind. 100. Only by the distaste that they gave unto my spirit, I felt there was something in me that refused to embrace them. But this consideration I then only had, when God gave me leave to swallow my spittle. Otherwise the noise, and strength, and force of these temptations would drown and overflow, and as it were, bury all such thoughts, or the remembrance of any such thing. While I was in this temptation, I often found my mind suddenly put upon it to curse and swear, or to speak some grievous thing against God, or Christ his Son, and of the Scriptures. 101. Now I thought, surely I am possessed of the devil, at other times, again, I thought I should be bereft of my wits. For instead of lauding and magnifying God the Lord, with others, if I have but heard him spoken of, presently some most horrible blasphemous thought or other would bolt out of my heart against him. So that whether I did think that God was, or again did think there was no such thing, no love, nor peace, nor gracious disposition could I feel within me. 102. These things did sink me into very deep despair. For I concluded that such things could not possibly be found amongst them that loved God. I often, when these temptations had been with force upon me, did compare myself to the case of such a child, whom some gypsy hath by force took up in her arms, and is carrying from friend and country. Kick sometimes I did, and also shriek and cry. But yet I was bound in the wings of the temptation, and the wind would carry me away. I thought also of Saul, and of the evil spirit that did possess him, and did greatly fear that my condition was the same with that of his. 1 Sam X. 103. In these days, when I have heard others talk of what was the sin against the Holy Ghost, then would the tempter so provoke me to desire to sin that against sin, that I was as if I could not, must not. 
neither should be quiet until I had committed it. Now no sin would serve but that. If it were to be committed by speaking of such a word, then I have been as if my mouth would have spoken that word, whether I would or no. And in so strong a measure was this temptation upon me, that often I have been ready to clap my hand under my chin, to hold my mouth from opening. And to that end also, I have had thoughts at other times, to leap with my head downward, into some muckhill hole or other, to keep my mouth from speaking. 104. Now again I beheld the condition of the dog and toad, and counted the estate of everything that God had made, far better than this dreadful state of mine, and such as my companions were. Yeah, gladly would I have been in the condition of a dog or horse, for I knew they had no souls to perish under the everlasting weight of hell, or sin, as mine was like to do. Nay, and though I saw this, felt this, and was broken to pieces with it. Yet that which added to my sorrow was, I could not find, that with all my soul I did desire deliverance. That scripture did also tear and rend my soul in the midst of these distractions, the wicked are like the troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. ISA, 57. 20, 21. 105, And now my heart was, at times, exceeding hard, if I would have given a thousand pounds for a tear, I could not shed one, no nor sometimes scarce desire to shed one. I was much dejected, to think that this would be my lot. I saw some could mourn and lament their sin, and others again, could rejoice and bless God for Christ, and others again, could quietly talk of, and with gladness remember the word of God, while I only was in the storm or tempest. This much sunk me, I thought my condition was alone, should therefore much bewail my hard hap, but get out of, or get rid of these things, I could not. 106. While this temptation lasted, which was about a year, I could attend upon none of the ordinances of God, but with sore and great affliction. Yeah, then I was most distressed with blasphemies. If I had been hearing the word, then uncleanness, blasphemies and despair would hold me a captive there, if I had been reading, then sometimes I had sudden thoughts to question all I read, sometimes again. My mind would be so strangely snatched away, and possessed with other things, that I have neither known, nor regarded, nor remembered so much as the sentence that but now I have read. 107 in prayer also I have been greatly troubled at this time. Sometimes I have thought I have felt him behind me pulling my clothes, he would be also continually at me in time of prayer, to have done, break off, make haste, you have prayed enough, and stay no longer, still drawing my mind away. Sometimes also he would cast in such wicked thoughts as these, that I must pray to him, or for him, I have thought sometimes of that, fall down, or, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Matt. 3. 9. 108. Also, when because I have had wandering thoughts in the time of this duty, I have labored to compose my mind, and fix it upon God. Then with great force hath the tempter of labor to distract me, and confound me, and to turn away my mind, by presenting to my heart and fancy, the form of a bush, a bull, a besom, or the like. As if I should pray to these, to these he would also, at sometimes especially, so hold my mind, that I was as if I could think of nothing else, or pray to nothing else but to these, or such as they. 109, Yet at times I should have some strong and heart-affecting apprehensions of God, and the reality of the truth of His Gospel. But, oh! How would my heart, at such times, put forth itself with unexpressible groanings? My whole soul was then in every word, I should cry with pangs after God, that he would be merciful unto me. But then I should be daunted again with such conceits as these, I should think that God did mock at these my prayers, saying, and that in the audience of the holy angels, this poor simple wretch doth hanker after me. As if I had nothing to do with my mercy, but to bestow it on such as he. Alas, poor soul! How art thou deceived! It is not for such as thee to have favor with the highest. 110 then hath the tempter come upon me, also, with such discouragements as these, you are very hot for mercy, but I will cool you. This frame shall not last always, many have been as hot as you for a spurt, but I have quenched their zeal, 
and with this, such and such, who were fallen off, would be set before mine eyes. Then I should be afraid that I should do so too, but, thought I, I am glad this comes into my mind, well, I will watch, and take what care I can. Though you do, said Satan, I shall be too hard for you. I will cool you insensibly, by degrees, by little and little. What care I, saith he, though I be seven years in chilling your heart, if I can do it at last. Continual rocking will lull a crying child asleep, I will ply it close, but I will have my end accomplished. Though you be burning hot at present, I can pull you from this fire, I shall have you cold before it be long. 111. These things brought me into great straits, for as I at present could not find myself fit for present death, so I thought, to live long, would make me yet more unfit. For time would make me forget all, and where even the remembrance of the evil of sin, the worth of heaven, and the need I had of the blood of Christ to wash me, both out of mind and thought, but I thank Christ Jesus. These things did not at present make me slack my crying, but rather did put me more upon it, like her who met with adulterer, D.U.T. 22, 26, in which days that was a good word to me, after I had suffered these things a while, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, etc., shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Rom 8. 38, 39. And now I hoped long life would not destroy me, nor make me miss of heaven. 1 12, Yet I had some supports in this temptation, though they were then all questioned by me, that in Je 3. At the first was something to me. And so was the consideration of verse 5 of that chapter, that though we have spoken and done as evil things as we could, yet we should cry unto God, My Father, Thou art the guide of my youth, and shall return unto Him. 113. I had, also, once a sweet glance from that in 2 Cor v. 21, for He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I remember that one day, as I was sitting in a neighbor's house, and they're very sad at the consideration of my many blasphemies. And as I was saying in my mind, what ground have I to say that, who have been so vile and abominable, should ever inherit eternal life? That word came suddenly upon me, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Rom 8. 31, That also was an help unto me, because I live, ye shall live also. John 14. 19, but these words were but hints, touches, and short visits, though very sweet when present, only they lasted not. But, like to Peter's sheet, of a sudden were caught up from me, to heaven again. Acts x 16. 114. But afterwards the Lord did more fully and graciously discover Himself unto me, and indeed, did quite, not only deliver me from the guilt that, by these things was laid upon my conscience, but also from the very filth thereof. For the temptation was removed, and I was put into my right mind again, as other Christians were. 115. I remember that one day, as I was traveling into the country, and musing on the wickedness and blasphemy of my heart, and considering the enmity that was in me to God, that scripture came into my mind. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. Colonel I, 20. By which I was made to see, both again and again, that God and my soul were friends by His blood, yea, I saw that the justice of God, and my sinful soul could embrace and kiss each other, through His blood. This was a good day to me. I hope I shall never forget it. 116. At another time, as I sat by the fire in my house, and was musing on my wretchedness, the Lord made that also a precious word unto me, Forasmuch then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver those who through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Heb 2. 14, 15. I thought that the glory of these words was then so weighty on me, that I was both once and twice ready to swoon as I sate yet not with grief and trouble, but with solid joy and peace. 117, At this time also I sate under of holy Mr. Gifford, 
whose doctrine, by God's grace, was much for my stability. This man made it much his business to deliver the people of God from all those false and unsound tests, that by nature we are prone to. He would bid us take special heed, that we took not up any truth upon trust. As from this, or that, or any other man or men, but to cry mightily to God, that he would convince us of the reality thereof, and set us down therein by his own Spirit in the Holy Word. For, said he, if you do otherwise, when temptations come, if strongly, you not having received them with evidence from heaven, will find you want that help and strength now to resist, that once you thought you had. 118. This was as seasonable to my soul, as the former and latter rains in their season, for I had found, and that by sad experience, the truth of these his words, for I had felt no man can say, especially when tempted by the devil. That Jesus Christ is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Wherefore I found my soul, through grace, very apt to drink in this doctrine, and to incline to pray to God, that in nothing that pertained to God's glory, and my own eternal happiness. He would suffer me to be without the confirmation thereof from heaven. For now I saw clearly, there was an exceeding difference betwixt the notion of the flesh and blood, and the revelations of God in heaven, also a great difference betwixt that faith that is feigned, and according to man's wisdom. And that which comes by a man's being born thereto of God. Matt. 16. 15. 1 John v. 1. 119. But, oh! Now, how was my soul led from truth to truth by God? Even from the birth and cradle of the Son of God, to His accession, and second coming from heaven to judge the world. 120. Truly, I then found, upon this account, the great God was very good unto me, for, to my remembrance, there was not any thing that I then cried unto God to make known, and reveal unto me, but He was pleased to do it for me. I mean, not one part of the gospel of the Lord Jesus, but I was orderly led into it, methought I saw with great evidence, from the relation of the four evangelists, the wonderful work of God, in giving Jesus Christ to save us. From His conception and birth, even to His second coming to judgment, methought I was as if I had seen Him born, as if I had seen Him grow up. As if I had seen Him walk through this world, from the cradle to the cross, to which also, when He came, I saw how gently He gave Himself to be hanged, and nailed on it for my sins and wicked doings. Also as I was musing on this His progress, that dropped on my spirit, He was ordained for the slaughter. 1 Peter I, 12, 20. 121, When I have considered also the truth of His resurrection, and have remembered that word, Touch me not, Mary, etc. I have seen as if He had leaped out of the grave's mouth, for joy that He was risen again, and had got the conquest over our dreadful foes. John XX. 17, I have also in the Spirit, seen Him a man, on the right hand of God the Father for me. And have seen the manner of His coming from heaven, to judge the world with glory, and have been confirmed in these things by these scriptures following, Acts I, 9, 10, and 7. 56, and X, 42, Heb 7. 24 and 9. 28, Rev. I, 18, 1 Thess, 4. 17, 18. 1 12, Once I was troubled to know whether the Lord Jesus was man as well as God, and God as well as man, and truly, in those days, let men say what they would, unless I had it with evidence from heaven, all was nothing to me. I counted myself not set down in any truth of God. Well, I was much troubled about this point, and could not tell how to be resolved, at last, that in Rev. V. 6 came into my mind, and I beheld, and, to, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain. In the midst of the throne, thought I, there is the Godhead. In the midst of the elders, there is his manhood, but, oh! Methought this did glister. It was a goodly touch, and gave me sweet satisfaction. That other scripture also did help me much in this, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, etc. ISA, 9. 
6. 123. Also besides these teachings of God in His Word, the Lord made use of two things to confirm me in this truth, the one was the errors of the Quakers and the other was the guilt of sin. For as the Quakers did oppose this truth, so God did the more confirm me in it, by leading me into the Scripture that did wonderfully maintain it. 124. The errors that this people then maintained, were. 1. That the Holy Scriptures were not the Word of God. 2 that every man in the world had the Spirit of Christ, grace, faith, etc. 3. That Christ Jesus, as crucified, and dying sixteen hundred years ago, did not satisfy divine justice for the sins of the people. 4. That Christ's flesh and blood were within the saints. 5. That the bodies of the good and bad that are buried in the churchyard, shall not arise again. 6. That the resurrection is past with good men already. 7. That that man Jesus, that was crucified between two thieves, on Mount Calvary, in the land of Canaan, by Jerusalem, was not ascended above the starry heavens. 8. That he should not, even the same Jesus that died by the hands of the Jews, come again at the last day, and as man, judge all nations, etc. 125. Many more vile and abominable things were in those days fomented by them, by which I was driven to a more narrow search of the Scriptures, and was through their light and testimony, not only enlightened, but greatly confirmed and comforted in the truth, and, as I said, the guilt of sin did help me much. For still as that would come upon me, the blood of Christ did take it off again, and again, and again, and that too sweetly, according to the Scripture. O oh friends! Cry to God to reveal Jesus Christ unto you, there is none teacheth like him. 126. It would be too long here to stay, to tell you in particular, how God did set me down in all the things of Christ, and how he did, that he might so do, lead me into his words. Yeah, and also how he did open them unto me, and make them shine before me, and cause them to dwell with me, talk with me, and comfort me over and over both of his own being, and the being of his Son, and Spirit, and Word, and Gospel. 127. Only this, as I said before, I will say unto you again, that in general, he was pleased to take this course with me, first, to suffer me to be afflicted with temptations concerning them, and then reveal them unto me. As sometimes I should lie under great guilt for sin, even crushed to the ground therewith, and then the Lord would show me the death of Christ. Yea, so sprinkle my conscience with his blood, that I should find, and that before I was aware, that in that conscience, where but just now did reign and rage the law, even there would rest and abide the peace and love of God, through Christ. 128. Now I had an evidence, as I thought, of my salvation, from heaven, with many golden seals thereon, all hanging in my sight. Now could I remember this manifestation, and the other discovery of grace, with comfort. And should often long and desire that the last day were come, that I might be for ever inflamed with the sight, and joy, and communion of him, whose head was crowned with thorns, whose face was spit upon, and body broken. And soul made an offering for my sins. For whereas before I lay continually trembling at the mouth of hell, now methought I was got so far therefrom, that I could not, when I looked back, scarce discern it. And no. Oh, thought I, that I were fourscore years old now, that I might die quickly, that my soul might be gone to rest. 129. But before I had got thus far out of these my temptations, I did greatly long to see some ancient godly man's experience, who had writ some hundreds of years before I was born. For those who had writ in our days, I thought, but I desire them now to pardon me, that they had writ only that which others felt. Or else had, through the strength of their wits and parts, studied to answer such objections as they perceived others were perplexed with, without going down themselves into the deep. Well, after many such longings in my mind, the God, in whose hands are all our days and ways, did cast into my hand, one day, a book of Martin Luther's. It was his comment on the Galatians. It also was so old, that it was ready to fall piece from piece if I did but turn it over. 
Now I was pleased much that such an old book had fallen into my hand, the which when I had but a little way perused, I found my condition in his experience so largely and profoundly handled, as if his book had been written out of my heart. This made me marvel, for thus thought I, this man could not know anything of the state of Christians now, but must needs write and speak the experience of former days. 130. Besides, he doth most gravely also in that book, debate of the rise of these temptations, namely, blasphemy, desperation, and the like. Showing that the law of Moses, as well as the devil, death, and hell, hath a very great hand therein, the which, at first, was very strange to me, but considering and watching, I found it so indeed. But of particulars here, I intend nothing. Only this methinks I must let fall before all men, I do prefer this book of Martin Luther upon the Galatians, excepting the Holy Bible, before all the books that ever I had seen, as most fit for a wounded conscience. 131. And now I found, as I thought, that I loved Christ dearly, oh! Methought my soul cleaved unto him, my affections cleaved unto him, I felt love to him as hot as fire, and now, as Job said, I thought I should die in my nest. But I did quickly find, that my great love was but little, and that I, who had, as I thought, such burning love to Jesus Christ, could let him go again for a very trifle, God can tell how to abase us, and can hide pride from man. Quickly after this my love was tried to purpose. 132. For after the Lord had, in this manner, thus graciously delivered me from this great and sore temptation, and had set me down so sweetly in the faith of his holy gospel, and had given me such strong consolation and blessed evidence from heaven. Touching my interest in his love through Christ. The tempter came upon me again, and that with a more grievous and dreadful temptation than before. 133, and that was, to sell and part with this most blessed Christ, to exchange him for the things of this life, for anything. The temptation lay upon me for the space of a year, and did follow me so continually, that I was not rid of it one day in a month, no, not sometimes one hour in many days together, unless when I was asleep. 134. And though, in my judgment, I was persuaded, that those who were once effectually in Christ, as I hoped, through His grace, I had seen myself, could never lose Him for ever, the land shall not be sold for ever, for the land is mine, saith God. Leviticus 25. 23. Yet it was a continual vexation to me, to think that I should have so much as one such thought within me against a Christ, a Jesus, that had done for me as he had done. And yet then I had almost none others, but such blasphemous ones. 135 But it was neither my dislike of the thought, nor yet any desire and endeavor to resist, that in the least did shake or abate the continuation or force and strength thereof. For it did always, in almost whatever I thought, intermix itself therewith, in such sort, that I could neither eat my food, stoop for a pin, chop a stick, or cast mine eye to look on this or that, but still the temptation would come. Sell Christ for this, or sell Christ for that. Sell him, sell him. 136. Sometimes it would run in my thoughts, not so little as a hundred times together, sell him, sell him, sell him, against which, I may say, for whole hours together, I have been forced to stand as continually leaning and forcing my spirit against it. Lest haply, before I were aware, some wicked thought might arise in my heart, that might consent thereto. And sometimes the tempter would make me believe I had consented to it, but then I should be, as tortured upon a rack for whole days together. 137. This temptation did put me to such scares, lest I should at some times, I say, consent thereto, and be overcome therewith, that by the very force of my mind, in laboring to gainsay and resist this wickedness, my very body would be put into action or motion, by way of pushing or thrusting with my hands or elbows. Still answering, as fast as the destroyer said, Sell him, I will not, I will not, I will not, I will not. No, not for thousands, thousands, thousands of worlds, thus reckoning, lest I should, in the midst of these assaults, set too low a value on him, even until I scarce well knew where I was, or how to be composed again. 
138. At these seasons he would not let me eat my food at quiet, but, forsooth, when I was set at the table at my meat, I must go hence to pray, I must leave my food now, just now, so counterfeit holy also would this devil be. When I was thus tempted, I would say in myself, Now I am at meat, let me make an end. No, said he, you must do it now, or you will displease God, and despise Christ. Wherefore I was much afflicted with these things. And because of the sinfulness of my nature, imagining that these were impulses from God, I should deny to do it, as if I denied God, and then should I be as guilty, because I did not obey a temptation of the devil. As if I had broken the law of God indeed. 139 But to be brief, one morning as I did lie in my bed, I was, as at other times, most fiercely assaulted with this temptation, to sell and part with Christ. The wicked suggestion still running in my mind, sell him, sell him, sell him, sell him, sell him, as fast as a man could speak, against which also, in my mind, as at other times, I answered, no, no, not for thousands, thousands, thousands. At least twenty times together, but at last, after much striving, even until I was almost out of breath, I felt this thought pass through my heart, let him go, if he will. And I thought also, that I felt my heart freely consent thereto. Oh! The diligence of Satan! Oh! The desperateness of man's heart! 140. Now was the battle won, and down fell I as a bird that is shot from the top of a tree, into great guilt, and fearful despair. Thus getting out of my bed, I went moping into the field. But God knows, with as heavy a heart as mortal man, I think, could bear, where for the space of two hours, I was like a man bereft of life, and, as now, past all recovery, and bound over to eternal punishment. 141. And withal, that scripture did seize upon my soul, or profane persons as Esau, who for one morsel of meat, sold his birthright, for ye know, how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Heb 12. 16, 17. 142. Now was I as one bound, I felt myself shut up unto the judgment to come. Nothing now, for two years together, would abide with me, but damnation, and an expectation of damnation, I say, nothing now would abide with me but this, save some few moments for relief, as in the sequel you will see. 143. These words were to my soul, like fetters of brass to my legs, in the continual sound of which I went for several months together. But about ten or eleven o'clock on that day, as I was walking under an hedge, full of sorrow and guilt, God knows, and bemoaning myself for this hard hap, that such a thought should arise within me, suddenly this sentence rushed in upon me. The blood of Christ remits all guilt. At this I made a stand in my spirit, with that this word took hold upon me, the blood of Jesus Christ his Son, clean saith us from all sin. 1 John I, 7. 144. Now I began to conceive peace in my soul, and methought I saw, as if the tempter did leer and steal away from me, as being ashamed of what he had done. At the same time also I had my sin, and the blood of Christ, thus represented to me, that my sin, when compared to the blood of Christ, was no more to it, than this little clod or stone before me, is to this vast and wide field that here I see. This gave me good encouragement for the space of two or three hours, in which time also, methought, I saw, by faith, the Son of God, as suffering for my sins, but because it tarried not, I therefore sunk in my spirit, under exceeding guilt again. 145, but chiefly by the aforementioned scripture concerning Esau's selling of his birthright. For that scripture would lie all day long, all the week long, yea, all the year long in my mind, and hold me down, so that I could by no means lift up myself. For when I would strive to turn to this scripture or that, for relief, still that sentence would be sounding in me. For ye know, how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. 146. Sometimes, indeed, I should have a touch from that in Luke 22. 31. 
I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, but it would not abide upon me. Neither could I, indeed, when I considered my state, find ground to conceive in the least, that there should be the root of that grace in me, having sinned as I had done. Now was I tore and rent in an heavy case for many days together. 147. Then began I with sad and careful heart to consider of the nature and largeness of my sin, and to search into the word of God, if I could in any place espy a word of promise, or any encouraging sentence, by which I might take relief. Wherefore I began to consider that of Mark 3. 28. All sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewithsoever they shall blaspheme. Which place, methought at a blush, did contain a large and glorious promise for the pardon of high offences. But considering the place more fully, I thought it was rather to be understood, as relating more chiefly to those who had, while in a natural estate, committed such things as there are mentioned. But not to me, who had not only received light and mercy, but that had both after, and also contrary to that, so slighted Christ as I had done. 148. I feared, therefore, that this wicked sin of mine, might be that sin unpardonable, of which he there thus speaketh. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Mark 3. 29. And I did the rather give credit to this, because of that sentence in the Hebrews, for you know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And this stuck always with me. 149 And now was I both a burthen and a terror to myself. Nor did I ever so know, as now, what it was to be weary of my life, and yet afraid to die. Oh! How gladly now would I have been anybody but myself! Anything but a man, and in any condition but my own! For there was nothing did pass more frequently over my mind, than that it was impossible for me to be forgiven my transgression, and to be saved from the wrath to come. 150 And now I began to call again time that was spent. Wishing a thousand times twice told, that the day was yet to come when I should be tempted to such a sin. Concluding with great indignation, both against my heart, and all assaults, how I would rather have been torn in pieces, than be found a consenter thereto. But alas! These thoughts, and wishings, and resolvings were now too late to help me. This thought had passed my heart, God hath let me go, and I am fallen. Oh! Thought I, that it were with me as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me. Job 29. 2. 151. Then again, being loath and unwilling to perish, I began to compare my sin with others to see if I could find that any of those that were saved, had done as I had done. So I considered David's adultery, and murder, and found the most heinous crimes. And those two committed after light and grace received, but yet by considering that his transgressions were only such as were against the law of Moses, from which the Lord Christ could, with the consent of his word, deliver him, but mine was against the gospel. Yea, against the mediator thereof, I had sold my Saviour. 152 Now again should I be as if racked upon the wheel, when I considered, that, besides the guilt that possessed me, I should be so void of grace, so bewitched. What, thought I, must it be no sin but this? Must it needs be the great transgression? P.S. 19 13 Must that wicked one touch my soul? 1 John v. 18 Oh! What sting did I find in all these sentences? 153. What, thought I, is there but one sin that is unpardonable? But one sin that layeth the soul without the reach of God's mercy, and must I be guilty of that? Must it needs be that? Is there but one sin among so many millions of sins, for which there is no forgiveness, and must I commit this? Oh! Unhappy sin! Oh! Unhappy man! These things would so break and confound my spirit, that I could not tell what to do. I thought at times, they would have broke my wits, and still, to aggravate my misery, that would run in my mind, you know, how, that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, 
he was rejected. Oh! No one knows the terrors of those days but myself. 154. After this I began to consider of Peter's sin, which he committed in denying his master, and indeed, this came nighest to mine of any that I could find, for he had denied his Saviour, as I, after light and mercy received. Yeah, and that too, after warning given him. I also considered, that he did it both once and twice, and that, after time to consider betwixt. But though I put all these circumstances together, that, if possible I might find help, yet I considered again, that his was but a denial of his master, but mine was, a selling of my Saviour. Wherefore I thought with myself, that I came nearer to Judas, than either to David or Peter. 155, here again my torment would flame out and afflict me. Yeah, it would grind me, as it were to powder, to consider the preservation of God towards others, while I fell into the snare. For in my thus considering of other men's sins, and comparing them with mine own, I could evidently see, God preserved them, notwithstanding their wickedness, and would not let them, as he had let me, become a son of perdition. 156, But oh! How did my soul at this time prize the preservation that God did set about his people? Ah, how safely did I see them walk, whom God had hedged in! They were within his care, protection, and special providence, though they were full as bad as I by nature. Yet because he loved them, he would not suffer them to fall without the range of mercy, but as for me, I was gone, I had done it, he would not preserve me, nor keep me, but suffered me, because I was a reprobate, to fall as I had done. Now did those blessed places that speak of God's keeping his people, shine like the sun before me, though not to comfort me, yet to show me the blessed state and heritage of those whom the Lord had blessed. 157. Now I saw, that as God had his hand in all the providences and dispensations that overtook his elect, so he had his hand in all the temptations that they had to sin against him. Not to animate them to wickedness, but to choose their temptations and troubles for them, and also to leave them for a time, to such sins only that might not destroy, but humble them. As might not put them beyond, but lay them in the way of the renewing his mercy. But oh! What love, what care, what kindness and mercy did I now see, mixing itself with the most severe and dreadful of all God's ways to his people. He would let David, Hezekiah, Solomon, Peter, and others, fall, but he would not let them fall into sin unpardonable, nor into hell for sin. Oh! Thought I, these be the men that God hath loved. These be the men that God, though he chastiseth them, keeps them in safety by him, and them whom he makes to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. But all these thoughts added sorrow, grief, and horror to me, as whatever I now thought on, it was killing to me. If I thought how God kept his own, that was killing to me, if I thought of how I was fallen myself, that was killing to me. As all things wrought together for the best, and to do good to them that were the called, according to his purpose, so I thought that all things wrought for my damage, and for my eternal overthrow. 158. Then again I began to compare my sin with the sin of Judas, that, if possible, I might find if mine differed from that, which in truth is unpardonable, and oh! Thought I, if it should differ from it, though but the breadth of an hair, what a happy condition is my soul in! And by considering, I found that Judas did this intentionally, but mine was against my prayer and strivings, besides, his was committed with much deliberation, but mine in a fearful hurry. On a sudden, all this while I was tossed to and fro like the locusts, and driven from trouble to sorrow. Hearing always the sound of Esau's fall in mine ears, and the dreadful consequences thereof. 159 Yet this consideration about Judas's sin was, for a while, some little relief to me. For I saw I had not, as to the circumstances, transgressed so fully as he. But this was quickly gone again, for I thought with myself, there might be more ways than one to commit this unpardonable sin. Also I thought there might be degrees of that, as well as of other transgressions, wherefore, for aught I yet could perceive, this iniquity of mine might be such, as might never be passed by. 160. I was often now ashamed that I should be like such an ugly man as Judas, 
I thought also how loathsome I should be unto all the saints at the day of judgment, insomuch that now I could scarce see a good man, that I believed had a good conscience. But I should feel my heart tremble at him, while I was in his presence. Oh! Now I saw a glory in walking with God, and what a mercy it was to have a good conscience before him. 161 I was much about that time tempted to content myself by receiving some false opinion. As, that there should be no such thing as a day of judgment, that we should not rise again. And that sin was no such grievous thing, the tempter suggesting thus, for if these things should indeed be true, yet to believe otherwise would yield you ease for the present. If you must perish, never torment yourself so much beforehand, drive the thoughts of damning out of your mind, by possessing your mind with some such conclusions that atheists and ranters use to help themselves with all. 162 But oh! When such thoughts have led through my heart, how, as it were, within a step, hath death and judgment been in my view! Methought the judge stood at the door, I was as if it was come already, so that such things could have no entertainment. But methinks, I see by this, that Satan will use any means to keep the soul from Christ, he loveth not an awakened frame of spirit, security, blindness, darkness, and error, is the very kingdom and habitation of the wicked one. 163. I found it a hard work now to pray to God, because despair was swallowing me up, I thought I was as with a tempest driven away from God, for always when I cried to God for mercy, this would come in, tis too late, I am lost, God hath let me fall. Not to my correction, but condemnation, my sin is unpardonable, and I know, concerning Esau, how that after he had sold his birthright, he would have received the blessing, but was rejected. About this time I did light on that dreadful story of that miserable mortal Francis Spira. A book that was to my troubled spirit, as salt, when rubbed into a fresh wound, every sentence in that book, every groan of that man, with all the rest of his actions in his dolors, as his tears, his prayers, his gnashing of teeth, his wringing of hands, his twining and twisting, and languishing, and pining away under that mighty hand of God that was upon him, were as knives and daggers in my soul. Especially that sentence of his was frightful to me, man knows the beginning of sin. But who bounds the issues thereof? Then would the former sentence, as the conclusion of all, fall like an hot thunderbolt again upon my conscience. For you know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. 164. Then should I be struck into a very great trembling, insomuch that at some times I could, for whole days together, feel my very body, as well as my mind, to shake and totter under the sense of this dreadful judgment of God. That should fall on those that have sinned that most fearful and unpardonable sin. I felt also such a clogging and heat at my stomach, by reason of this my terror, that I was, especially at some times, as if my breastbone would split asunder. Then I thought of that concerning Judas, who by falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Acts I, 18. 165. I feared also that this was the mark that the Lord did set on Cain, even continual fear and trembling, under the heavy load of guilt that he had charged on him for the blood of his brother Abel. Thus did I wind, and twine, and shrink under the burthen that was upon me, which burthen also did so oppress me, that I could neither stand, nor go, nor lie, either at rest or quiet. 166. Yet that saying would sometimes come into my mind, he hath received gifts for the rebellious. Psalm 68. 18. The rebellious, thought I. Why surely they are such as once were under subjection to their prince. Even those who after they have sworn subjection to his government, have taken up arms against him, and this, thought I, is my very condition, I once loved him, feared him, served him, but now I am a rebel. I have sold him, I have said, let him go, if he will but yet he has gifts for rebels, and then why not for me? 167. This sometimes I thought on, and should labor to take hold thereof, that some, though small refreshment, might have been conceived by me, but in this also I missed of my desire, I was driven with force beyond it. I was like a man going to execution, 
even by that place where he would fain creep in and hide himself, but may not. 168. Again, after I had thus considered the sins of the saints in particular, and found mine went beyond them, then I began to think with myself, set the case I should put all theirs together, and mine alone against them. Might I not then find some encouragement? For if mine, though bigger than any one, yet should be but equal to all, then there is hopes. For that blood that hath virtue enough in it to wash away all theirs, had virtue enough in it to do away mine, though this one be full as big, if not bigger than all theirs. Here again, I should consider the sin of David, of Solomon, of Manasseh, of Peter, and the rest of the great offenders, and should also labor, what I might with fairness, to aggravate and heighten their sins by several circumstances. 169. I should think with myself that David shed blood to cover his adultery, and that by the sword of the children of Ammon, a work that could not be done, but by continuance, deliberate contrivance, which was a great aggravation to his sin. But then this would turn upon me, ah! But these were but sins against the law, from which there was a Jesus sent to save them, but yours is a sin against the Saviour, and who shall save you from that? 170. Then I thought on Solomon, and how he sinned in loving strange women, falling away to their idols, in building them temples, in doing this after light, in his old age. After great mercy received, but the same conclusion that cut me off in the former consideration, cut me off as to this. Namely, that all those were but sins against the law, for which God had provided a remedy, but I had sold my Saviour, and there remained no more sacrifice for sin. 171 I would then add to these men's sins, the sins of Manasseh. How that he built altars for idols in the house of the Lord. He also observed times, used enchantments, had to do with wizards, was a wizard, had his familiar spirits, burned his children in the fire in sacrifice to devils, and made the streets of Jerusalem run down with the blood of innocents. These, thought I, are great sins, sins of a bloody color, but yet it would turn again upon me, they are none of them of the nature of yours, you have parted with Jesus, you have sold your Saviour. 172. This one consideration would always kill my heart, my sin was point blank against my Saviour, and that too, at that height, that I had in my heart said of him, let him go, if he will. Oh! Methought this sin was bigger than the sins of a country, of a kingdom, or of the whole world, no one pardonable, nor all of them together, was able to equal mine, mine out went them every one. A relation of my imprisonment in the month of November 1660. When, by the good hand of my God, I had for five or six years together, without any interruption, freely preached the blessed gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And had also, through His blessed grace, some encouragement by His blessing thereupon. The devil, that old enemy of man's salvation, took his opportunity to inflame the hearts of his vassals against me, insomuch that at the last, I was laid out for by the warrant of a justice, and was taken and committed to prison. The relation thereof is as followeth. Upon the twelfth of this instant, November 1660, I was desired by some of the friends in the country to come to teach at Samsell, by Harlington, in Bedfordshire. To whom I made a promise, if the Lord permitted, to be with them on the time aforesaid. The justice hearing thereof, whose name is Mr. Francis Wingate, forthwith issued out his warrant to take me, and bring me before him, and in the meantime to keep a very strong watch about the house where the meeting should be kept. As if we that were to meet together in that place did intend to do some fearful business, to the destruction of the country. When alas! The constable, when he came in, found us only with our Bibles in our hands, ready to speak and hear the word of God, for we were just about to begin our exercise. Nay, we had begun in prayer for the blessing of God upon our opportunity, intending to have preached the word of the Lord unto them there present, one but the constable coming in prevented us. So I was taken and forced to depart the room. But had I been minded to have played the coward, I could have escaped and kept out of his hands. For when I was come to my friend's house, there was whispering that that day I should be taken, for there was a warrant out to take me which when my friend heard, he being somewhat timorous, questioned whether we had best have our meeting or not. And whether it might not be better for me to depart, 
lest they should take me and have me before the justice, and after that send me to prison, for he knew better than I what spirit they were of, living by them to whom I said, No, by no means. I will not stir, neither will I have the meeting dismissed for this. Come, be of good cheer, let us not be daunted, our cause is good, we need not be ashamed of it, to preach God's word, is so good a work, that we shall be well rewarded, if we suffer for that. Or to this purpose, but as for my friend, I think he was more afraid of me, than of himself. After this I walked into the close, where I somewhat seriously considering the matter, this came into my mind, that I had showed myself hearty and courageous in my preaching, and had, blessed be grace, made it my business to encourage others. Therefore thought I, if I should now run, and make an escape, it will be of a very ill savour in the country. For what will my weak and newly converted brethren think of it, but that I was not so strong in deed as I was in word? Also I feared that if I should run now there was a warrant out for me, I might by so doing make them afraid to stand, when great words only should be spoken to them. Besides I thought, that seeing God of His mercy should choose me to go upon the forlorn hope in this country, that is, to be the first, that should be opposed, for the gospel. If I should fly, it might be a discouragement to the whole body that might follow after. And further, I thought the world thereby would take occasion at my cowardliness, to have blasphemed the gospel, and to have had some ground to suspect worse of me and my profession, than I deserved. These things with others considered by me, I came in again to the house, with a full resolution to keep the meeting, and not to go away, though I could have been gone about an hour before the officer apprehended me, but I would not. For I was resolved to see the utmost of what they could say or do unto me. For blessed be the Lord, I knew of no evil that I had said or done. And so, as aforesaid, I begun the meeting. But being prevented by the constable's coming in with his warrant to take me, I could not proceed. But before I went away, I spake some few words of counsel and encouragement to the people, declaring to them, that they saw we were prevented of our opportunity to speak and hear the word of God, and were like to suffer for the same. Desiring them that they would not be discouraged, for it was a mercy to suffer upon so good account. For we might have been apprehended as thieves or murderers, or for other wickedness. But blessed be God it was not so, but we suffer as Christians for well-doing, and we had better be the persecuted, than the persecutors, etc. But the constable and the justice's man waiting on us, would not be at quiet till they had me away and that we departed the house. But because the justice was not at home that day, there was a friend of mine engaged for me to bring me to the constable on the morrow morning. Otherwise the constable must have charged a watch with me, or have secured me some other way, my crime was so great. So on the next morning we went to the constable, and so to the justice. Two he asked the constable what we did, where we was met together, and what we had with us. I trow, he meant whether we had armour or not. But when the constable told him that there were only met a few of us together to preach and hear the word, and no sign of anything else, he could not well tell what to say, yet because he had sent for me. He did adventure to put out a few proposals to me, which were to this effect, namely, what I did there. And why I did not content myself with following my calling. For it was against the law, that such as I should be admitted to do as I did. John Bunyan. To which I answered, that the intent of my coming thither, and to other places, was to instruct, and counsel people to forsake their sins, and close in with Christ, lest they did miserably perish. And that I could do both these without confusion, to wit, follow my calling, and preach the word also. At which words, he three was in a chafe, as it appeared, for he said that he would break the neck of our meetings. Bun. I said, it may be so. Then he wished me to get sureties to be bound for me, or else he would send me to the jail. My sureties being ready, I called them in, and when the bond for my appearance was made, he told them, that they was bound to keep me from preaching. And that if I did preach, their bonds would be forfeited. To which I answered, that then I should break them, for I should not leave speaking the word of God, even to counsel, comfort, exhort and teach the people among whom I came. And I thought this to be a work that had no hurt in it, but was rather worthy of commendation, than blame. Wingate. 
Whereat he told me, that if they would not be so bound, my mit imus must be made, and I sent to the jail, there to lie to the quarter sessions. Now while my mit imus was making, the justice was withdrawn. And in comes an old enemy to the truth, Dr. Lindale, who, when he was come in, fell to taunting at me with many reviling terms. Bun. To whom I answered, that I did not come thither to talk with him, but with the justice. Whereat he supposed that I had nothing to say for myself, and triumphed as if he had got the victory, charging and condemning me for meddling with that for which I could show no warrant, and asked me, if I had taken the oaths. And if I had not, it was pity but that I should be sent to prison, etc. I told him, that if I was minded, I could answer to any sober question that he should put to me. He then urged me again, how I could prove it lawful for me to preach, with a great deal of confidence of the victory. But at last, because he should see that I could answer him if I listed, I cited to him that verse in Peter, which saith, Every man hath received the gift, even so let him minister the same, etc. Lind. I, saith he, to whom is that spoken? Bun. To whom, said I, why to every man that hath received a gift from God? Mark, saith the apostle, as every man that hath received a gift from God, etc., and again, you may all prophesy one by one. Whereat the man was a little stopped, and went a softlier pace, but not being willing to lose the day, he began again, and said, Lind. Indeed, I do remember that I have read of one Alexander a coppersmith, who did much oppose, and disturb the apostles, aiming it is like at me, because I was a tinker. Bun. To which I answered, that I also had read of very many priests and Pharisees, that had their hands in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lind. I, saith he, and you are one of those scribes and Pharisees, for you, with a pretense, make long prayers to devour widows' houses. Bun. I answered, that if he had got no more by preaching and praying than I had done, he would not be so rich as now he was. But that scripture coming into my mind, answer not a fool according to his folly, I was as sparing of my speech as I could, without prejudice to truth. Now by this time my mit imus was made, and I committed to the constable, to be sent to the jail in Bedford, etc. But as I was going, two of my brethren met with me by the way, and desired the constable to stay, supposing that they should prevail with the justice, through the favour of a pretended friend, to let me go at liberty. So we did stay, while they went to the justice, and after much discourse with him, it came to this, that if I would come to him again, and say some certain words to him, I should be released. Which when they told me, I said if the words was such that might be said with a good conscience, I should or else I should not. So through their importunity went back again, but not believing that I should be delivered, for I feared their spirit was too full of opposition to the truth to let me go, unless I should, in something or other. Dishonor my God and wound my conscience. Wherefore, as I went, I lifted up my heart to God, for light and strength to be kept, that I might not do anything that might either dishonor Him, or wrong my own soul. Or be a grief or discouragement to any that was inclining after the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, when I came to the justice again, there was Mr. Foster of Bedford, who, coming out of another room, and seeing me by the light of the candle, for it was dark night when I went thither, he said unto me, Who is there? John Bunyan. With such seeming affection, as if he would have leaped on my neck and kissed for me, which made me somewhat wonder, that such a man as he, with whom I had so little acquaintance, and, besides, that had ever been a close opposer of the ways of God, should carry himself so full of love to me. But, afterwards, when I saw what he did, it caused me to remember those sayings, Their tongues are smoother than oil, but their words are drawn swords. And again, beware of men, etc. When I five had answered him, that blessed be God, I was well. He said, What is the occasion of your being here? Or to that purpose? To whom I answered, that I was at a meeting of people a little way off, intending to speak a word of exhortation to them. The justice hearing thereof, said I, was pleased to send his warrant to fetch me before him, etc. Faust. So, said he, I understand, but well, 
if you will promise to call the people no more together, you shall have your liberty to go home. For my brother is very loath to send you to prison, if you will be but ruled. Bon. Sir, said I, pray what do you mean by calling the people together? My business is not anything among them, when they are come together, but to exhort them to look after the salvation of their souls, that they may be saved, etc. Faust. Saith he, we must not enter into explication, or dispute now. But if you will say you will call the people no more together, you may have your liberty, if not, you must be sent away to prison. Bon. Sir, said I, I shall not force or compel any man to hear me. But yet, if I come into any place where there is a people met together, I should, according to the best of my skill and wisdom, exhort and counsel them to seek out after the Lord Jesus Christ, for the salvation of their souls. Faust. He said, That was none of my work, I must follow my calling, and if I would but leave off preaching, and follow my calling, I should have the justice's favor, and be acquitted presently. Bun. To whom I said, that I could follow my calling, and that too, namely, preaching the word, and I did look upon it as my duty to do them both, as I had an opportunity. Faust. He said, to have any such meetings was against the law. And, therefore, he would have me leave off, and say, I would call the people no more together. Bun. To whom I said, that I durst not make any further promise, for my conscience would not suffer me to do it. And again, I did look upon it as my duty to do as much good as I could, not only in my trade, but also in communicating to all people wheresoever I came the best knowledge I had in the word. Faust. He told me that I was the nearest the papists of any, and that he would convince me of immediately. Bun. I asked him, wherein? Faust. He said, in that we understood the scriptures literally. Bun. I told him that those that were to be understood literally, we understood them so, but for those that was to be understood otherwise, we endeavored so to understand them. Faust. He said, Which of the scriptures do you understand literally? Bun. I said this, He that believes shall be saved. This was to be understood just as it is spoken, that whosoever believeth in Christ shall, according to the plain and simple words of the text, be saved. Faust. He said that I was ignorant, and did not understand the scriptures, for how, said he, can you understand them when you know not the original Greek? Etc. Bun. To whom I said, that if that was his opinion, that none could understand the scriptures but those that had the original Greek, etc., then but a very few of the poorest sort should be saved, this is harsh. Yet the scripture saith, that God hides these things from the wise and prudent, that is, from the learned of the world, and reveals them to babes and sucklings. Faust. He said there were none that heard me but a company of foolish people. Bun. I told him that there was the wise as well as the foolish that do hear me, and again, those that were most commonly counted foolish by the world are the wisest before God. Also, that God had rejected the wise, and mighty, and noble, and chosen the foolish, and the base. Faust. He told me that I made people neglect their calling, and that God had commanded people to work six days, and serve him on the seventh. Bun. I told him that it was the duty of people, both rich and poor, to look out for their souls on them days as well as for their bodies, and that God would have his people exhort one another daily, while it is called today. Faust. He said again that there were none but a company of poor, simple, ignorant people that come to hear me. Bun. I told him that the foolish and the ignorant had most need of teaching and information. And, therefore, it would be profitable for me to go on in that work. Faust. Well, said he, to conclude, but will you promise that you will not call the people together any more? And then you may be released and go home. Bun. I told him that I durst say no more than I had said, for I durst not leave off that work which God had called me to. So he withdrew from me, and then came several of the justice's servants to me, and told me that I stood so much upon a nicety. Their master, they said, was willing to let me go, and if I would but say I would call the people no more together, 
I might have my liberty, etc. Bun. I told them there were more ways than one in which a man might be said to call the people together. As for instance, if a man get upon the marketplace, and there read a book, or the like, though he do not say to the people, Sirs, come hither and here. Yet if they come to him because he reads, he, by his very reading, may be said to call them together, because they would not have been there to hear if he had not been there to read. And seeing this might be termed a calling the people together. I durst not say, I would not call them together, for then, by the same argument, my preaching might be said to call them together. Wing. And Faust. Then came the Justice and Mr. Foster to me again. We had a little more discourse about preaching, but because the method of it is out of my mind, I pass it. And when they saw that I was at a point, and would not be moved nor persuaded, Mr. Foster, the man that did at first express so much love to me, told the Justice that then he must send me away to prison. And that he would do well, also, if he would present all those that were the cause of my coming among them to meetings. Thus we parted. And, verily, as I was going forth of the doors, I had much ado to forbear saying to them that I carried the peace of God along with me, but I held my peace, and, blessed be the Lord, went away to prison, with God's comfort in my poor soul. After I had lain in the jail five or six days, the brethren sought means, again, to get me out by bondsmen, for so ran my mit imus, that I should lie there till I could find sureties. They went to a justice at Elstow, one Mr. Crumpton, to desire him to take bond for my appearing at the quarter sessions. At the first he told them he would. But afterwards he made a demur at the business, and desired first to see my mit imus, which ran to this purpose, that I went about to several conventicles in the county, to the great disparagement of the government of the Church of England, etc. When he had seen it, he said that there might be something more against me than was expressed in my mit imus, and that he was but a young man, therefore he durst not do it. This my jailer told me. And, whereat I was not at all daunted but rather glad, and saw evidently that the Lord had heard me. For before I went down to the justice, I begged of God that if I might do more good by being at liberty than in prison, that then I might be set at liberty, but if not, his will be done. For I was not altogether without hopes but that my imprisonment might be an awakening to the saints in the country, therefore I could not tell well which to choose, only I, in that manner, did commit the thing to God. And verily, at my return, I did meet my God sweetly in the prison again, comforting of me and satisfying of me that it was His will and mine that I should be there. When I came back again to prison, as I was musing at the slender answer of the justice, this word dropped in upon my heart with some life, for he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Thus have I, in short, declared the manner and occasion of my being in prison, where I lie waiting the good will of God, to do with me as he pleaseth. Knowing that not one hair of my head can fall to the ground without the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Let the rage and malice of men be never so great, they can do no more, nor go any further, than God permits them. But when they have done their worst, we know all things shall work together for good to them that love God. Farewell. Here is the sum of my examination before Justice Keelan, Justice Chester, Justice Blundale, Justice Beecher, Justice Snag, etc. After I had lain in prison above seven weeks, the quarter sessions were to be kept in Bedford, for the county thereof, unto which I was to be brought. And when my jailer had set me before those justices, there was a bill of indictment preferred against me. The extent thereof was as followeth, that John Bunyan, of the town of Bedford, laborer, being a person of such and such conditions, he hath, since such a time, devilishly and perniciously abstained from coming to church to hear divine service. And is a common upholder of several unlawful meetings and conventicles, to the great disturbance and distraction of the good subjects of this kingdom, contrary to the laws of our sovereign lord the king, etc. The clerk. When this was read, the clerk of the session said unto me, What say you to this? Bun. I said, that as to the first part of it, I was a common frequenter of the church of God. And was also, by grace, a member with the people, over whom Christ is the head. Keelan. But, Seth Justice Keelan, who was the judge in that court, do you come to church, 
you know what I mean, to the parish church, to hear divine service. Bun. I answered, no, I did not. Keel. He asked me, why? Bun. I said, because I did not find it commanded in the word of God. Keel. He said, we were commanded to pray. Bun. I said, but not by the common prayer book. Keel. He said, how then? Bun. I said, with the Spirit. As the Apostle saith, I will pray with the Spirit, and with the understanding. 1 Cor 14. 15. Keel. He said, we might pray with the Spirit, and with the understanding, and with the common prayer book also. Bun. I said, that the prayers in the common prayer book were such as was made by other men, and not by the motions of the Holy Ghost, within our hearts, and as I said, the Apostle saith, he will pray with the Spirit, and with the understanding. Not with the Spirit and the common prayer book. Another justice. What do you count prayer? Do you think it is to say a few words over before or among a people? Bun. I said, no, not so. For men might have many elegant or excellent words, and yet not pray at all, but when a man prayeth, he doth, through a sense of those things which he wants, which sense is begotten by the Spirit, pour out his heart before God through Christ. Though his words be not so many and so excellent as others are. Justices. They said, that was true. Bun. I said, this might be done without the common prayer book. Another. One of them said, I think it was Justice Blundale, or Justice Snag, how should we know that you do not write out your prayers first, and then read them afterwards to the people? This he spake in a laughing way. Bun. I said, it is not our use, to take a pen and paper, and write a few words thereon, and then go and read it over to a company of people. But how should we know it, said he. Bun. Sir, it is none of our custom, said I. Keel. But said Justice Keelan, it is lawful to use the common prayer, and such like forms, for Christ taught his disciples to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And further, said he, cannot one man teach another to pray? Faith comes by hearing. And one man may convince another of sin, and therefore prayers made by men, and read over, are good to teach, and help men to pray. While he was speaking these words, God brought that word into my mind, in the eighth of the Romans, at the twenty-sixth verse. I say, God brought it, for I thought not on it before, but as he was speaking, it came so fresh into my mind, and was set so evidently before me, as if the scripture had said, Take me, take me, so when he had done speaking. Bun. I said, Sir, the Scripture saith, that it is the Spirit that helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself mocketh intercession for us, with sighs and groanings which cannot be uttered. Mark, said I, it doth not say the common prayer book teacheth us how to pray, but the Spirit. And it is the Spirit that helpeth our infirmities, saith the Apostle, he doth not say it is the common prayer book. And as to the Lord's Prayer, although it be an easy thing to say, Our Father, etc., with the mouth, yet there is very few that can, in the Spirit, say the two first words in that prayer. That is, that can call God their Father, as knowing what it is to be born again, and as having experience, that they are begotten of the Spirit of God, which if they do not, all is but babbling, etc. Keel. Justice Keelan said that that was a truth. Bun. And I say further, as to your saying that one man may convince another of sin, and that faith comes by hearing, and that one man may tell another how he should pray, etc. I say men may tell each other of their sins, but it is the Spirit that must convince them. And though it be said that faith comes by hearing, yet it is the Spirit that worketh faith in the heart through hearing, or else they are not profited by hearing. Heb 4. 12. And that though one man may tell another how he should pray, yet, as I said before, he cannot pray, nor make his condition known to God, except the Spirit help. It is not the common prayer book that can do this. It is the Spirit that showeth us our sins, 
and the Spirit that showeth us a Saviour, Jn 16. 16, and the Spirit that stirreth up in our hearts desires to come to God, for such things as we stand in need of, Matt 11. 27, even sighing out our souls unto Him for them with groans which cannot be uttered. With other words to the same purpose. At this they were set. Keel. But says Justice Keelan, what have you against the common prayer book? Bun. I said, Sir, if you will hear me, I shall lay down my reasons against it. Keel. He said I should have liberty, but first, said he, let me give you one caution, take heed of speaking irreverently of the common prayer book. For if you do so, you will bring great damage upon yourself. Bun. So I proceeded, and said, my first reason was, because it was not commanded in the word of God, and therefore I could not use it. Another. One of them said, Where do you find it commanded in the scripture, that you should go to Elstow, or Bedford, and yet it is lawful to go to either of them, is it not? Bun. I said, to go to Elstow, or Bedford, was a civil thing, and not material, though not commanded, and yet God's word allowed me to go about my calling, and therefore if it lay there, then to go thither, etc. But to pray, was a great part of the divine worship of God, and therefore it ought to be done according to the rule of God's word. Another. One of them said, He will do harm, let him speak no further. Keel. Justice Keelan said, No, no, never fear him, we are better established than so, he can do no harm, we know the common prayer book hath been ever since the Apostle's time, and it is lawful for it to be used in the church. Bun. I said, show me the place in the epistles, where the common prayer book is written, or one text of scripture, that commands me to read it, and I will use it. But yet, notwithstanding, said I, they that have a mind to use it, they have their liberty, that is, I would not keep them from it, but for our parts, we can pray to God without it. Blessed be his name. With that, one of them said, Who is your God? Beelzebub. Moreover, they often said, that I was possessed with the spirit of delusion, and of the devil. All which sayings I passed over, the Lord forgive them. And further, I said, Blessed be the Lord for it, we are encouraged to meet together, and to pray, and exhort one another, for, we have had the comfortable presence of God among us. Forever blessed be his holy name. Keel. Justice Keelan called this peddler's French, saying, that I must leave off my canting. The Lord opened his eyes. Bun. I said that we ought to exhort one another daily, while it is called today, etc. Keel. Justice Keelan said that I ought not to preach, and asked me where I had my authority. With other such like words. Bun. I said that I would prove that it was lawful for me, and such as I am, to preach the word of God. Keel. He said unto me, By what scripture? Bun. I said, By that in the first epistle of Peter, chapter 4. 10, 11, and Acts 18, with other scriptures, which he would not suffer me to mention. But said, Hold, not so many, which is the first. Bun. I said this, as every man hath received the gift, even so let him minister the same unto another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, etc. Keel. He said, Let me a little open that scripture to you, as every man hath received the gift, that is, said he, as every one hath received a trade, so let him follow it. If any man have received a gift of tinkering, as thou hast done, let him follow his tinkering. And so other men their trades. And the divine his calling, etc. Bun. Nay, sir, said I, but it is most clear, that the apostle speaks here of preaching the word, if you do but compare both the verses together, the next verse explains this gift what it is, saying, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. So that it is plain, that the Holy Ghost doth not so much in this place exhort to civil callings, as to the exercising of those gifts that we have received from God. I would have gone on, but he would not give me leave. Keel. He said, we might do it in our families, 
but not other ways. Bun. I said, if it was lawful to do good to some, it was lawful to do good to more. If it was a good duty to exhort our families, it was good to exhort others. But if they held it a sin to meet together to seek the face of God, and exhort one another to follow Christ, I should sin still, for so we should do. Keel. He said he was not so well versed in scripture as to dispute, or words to that purpose. And said, moreover, that they could not wait upon me any longer, but said to me, Then you confess the indictment, do you not? Now, and not till now, I saw I was indicted. Bun. I said, This I confess, we have had many meetings together, both to pray to God, and to exhort one another, and that we had the sweet comforting presence of the Lord among us for our encouragement, blessed be his name therefore. I confessed myself guilty no otherwise. Keel. Then, said he, bear your judgment. You must be head back again to prison, and there lie for three months following. And at three months' end, if you do not submit to go to church to hear divine service, and leave your preaching, you must be banished the realm, and if, after such a day as shall be appointed you to be gone, you shall be found in this realm, etc. Or be found to come over again without special license from the king, etc., you must stretch by the neck for it, I tell you plainly, and so he bid my jailer have me away. Bun. I told him, as to this matter, I was at a point with him. For if I were out of prison today, I would preach the gospel again tomorrow, by the help of God. Another. To which one made me some answer, but my jailer pulling me away to be gone, I could not tell what he said. Thus I departed from them. And I can truly say, I bless the Lord Jesus Christ for it, that my heart was sweetly refreshed in the time of my examination, and also afterwards, at my returning to the prison. So that I found Christ's words more than bare trifles, where he saith, I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay, nor resist. Luke 21. 15, And that his peace no man can take from us. Thus have I given you the substance of my examination. The Lord make this profitable to all that shall read or hear it. Farewell. The substance of some discourse had between the clerk of the peace and myself. When he came to admonish me, according to the tenor of that law, by which I was in prison. When I had lain in prison other twelve weeks, and now not knowing what they intended to do with me, upon the third of April 1661, comes Mr. Cobb unto me, as he told me, being sent by the justices to admonish me. And demand of me submittance to the Church of England, etc. The extent of our discourse was as followeth. Cobb. When he was come into the house he sent for me out of my chamber. Who, when I was come unto him, he said, Neighbor Bunyan, how do you do? Bun. I thank you, sir, said I, very well, blessed be the Lord. Cobb. Saith he, I come to tell you, that it is desired you would submit yourself to the laws of the land, or else at the next sessions it will go worse with you, even to be sent away out of the nation, or else worse than that. Bun. I said that I did desire to demean myself in the world, both as becometh a man and a Christian. Cobb. But, saith he, you must submit to the laws of the land, and leave off those meetings which you was wont to have. For the statute law is directly against it, and I am sent to you by the justices to tell you that they do intend to prosecute the law against you if you submit not. Bun. I said, Sir, I conceive that that law by which I am in prison at this time, doth not reach or condemn either me, or the meetings which I do frequent. That law was made against those, that being designed to do evil in their meetings, making the exercise of religion their pretense, to cover their wickedness. It doth not forbid the private meetings of those that plainly and simply make it their only end to worship the Lord, and to exhort one another to edification. My end in meeting with others is simply to do as much good as I can, by exhortation and counsel, according to that small measure of light which God hath given me, and not to disturb the peace of the nation. Cobb. Every one will say the same, said he, you see the late insurrection six at London, under what glorious pretenses they went, and yet, indeed, they intended no less than the ruin of the kingdom and commonwealth. 
Bun. That practice of theirs, I abhor, said I, yet it doth not follow that, because they did so, therefore all others will do so. I look upon it as my duty to behave myself under the king's government, both as becomes a man and a Christian, and if an occasion were offered me, I should willingly manifest my loyalty to my prince, both by word and deed. Cobb. Well, said he, I do not profess myself to be a man that can dispute, but this I say, truly, neighbor Bunyan, I would have you consider this matter seriously, and submit yourself. You may have your liberty to exhort your neighbor in private discourse, so be you do not call together an assembly of people, and, truly, you may do much good to the Church of Christ, if you would go this way. And this you may do, and the law not abridge you of it. It is your private meetings that the law is against. Bun. Sir, said I, if I may do good to one by my discourse. Why may I not do good to two? And if to two, why not to four, and so to eight? Etc. Cobb. I, saith he, and to a hundred, I warrant you. Bun. Yes, sir, said I, I think I should not be forbid to do as much good as I can. Cobb. But, saith he, you may but pretend to do good, and instead, notwithstanding, do harm, by seducing the people, you are, therefore, denied your meeting so many together, lest you should do harm. Bun. And yet, said I, you say the law tolerates me to discourse with my neighbor, surely there is no law tolerates me seduce any one, therefore if I may by the law discourse with one, surely it is to do him good. And if I by discoursing may do good to one, surely, by the same law, I may do good to many. Cobb. The law, saith he, doth expressly forbid your private meetings, therefore they are not to be tolerated. Bun. I told him that I would not entertain so much uncharitableness of that parliament in the thirty-fifth of Elizabeth, or of the queen herself, as to think they did, by that law, intend the oppressing of any of God's ordinances. Or the interrupting any in way of God. But men may, in the resting of it, turn it against the way of God, but take the law in itself, and it only fighteth against those that drive at mischief in their hearts and meeting, making religion only their cloak, color, or pretense. For so are the words of the statute, if any meetings, under color or pretense of religion, etc. Cobb. Very good, therefore the king, seeing that pretenses are usually in and among people, so as to make religion their pretense only. Therefore he, and the law before him, doth forbid such private meetings, and tolerates only public, you may meet in public. Bun. Sir, said I, let me answer you in a similitude, set the case that, at such a wood corner, there did usually come forth thieves, to do mischief, must there therefore a law be made, that every one that cometh out there shall be killed. May not there come out true men as well as thieves out from thence. Just thus is it in this case, I do think there may be many that may design the destruction of the commonwealth. But it doth not follow therefore that all private meetings are unlawful, those that transgress, let them be punished. And if at any time I myself should do any act in my conversation as doth not become a man and Christian, let me bear the punishment. And as for your saying I may meet in public, if I may be suffered, I would gladly do it. Let me have but meeting enough in public, and I shall care the less to have them in private. I do not meet in private because I am afraid to have meetings in public. I bless the Lord that my heart is at that point, that if any man can lay anything to my charge either in doctrine or in practice, in this particular, that can be proved error or heresy, I am willing to disown it, even in the very marketplace. But if it be truth, then to stand to it to the last drop of my blood. And, sir, said I, you ought to commend me for so doing. To err and to be a heretic are two things. I am no heretic, because I will not stand refractorily to defend any one thing that is contrary to the word. Prove anything which I hold to be an error, and I will recant it. Cobb. But, Goodman Bunyan, said he, methinks you need not stand so strictly upon this one thing, as to have meetings of such public assemblies. Cannot you submit, and, notwithstanding, do as much good as you can, in a neighborly way, without having such meetings? Bun. Truly, 
Sir, said I, I do not desire to commend myself, but to think meanly of myself. Yet when I do most despise myself, taking notice of that small measure of light which God hath given me, also that the people of the Lord, by their own saying, are edified thereby. Besides, when I see that the Lord, through grace, hath in some measure blessed my labor, I dare not but exercise that gift which God hath given me for the good of the people. And I said further, that I would willingly speak in public if I might. Cobb. He said, that I might come to the public assemblies and hear. What though you do not preach? You may hear. Do not think yourself so well enlightened, and that you have received a gift so far above others, but that you may hear other men preach. Or to that purpose. Bun. I told him, I was as willing to be taught as to give instruction, and I looked upon it as my duty to do both. For, said I, a man that is a teacher, he himself may learn also from another that teacheth, as the apostle saith, we may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn. 1 Cor 14. 31. That is, every man that hath received a gift from God, he may dispense it, that others may be comforted, and when he hath done, he may hear and learn, and be comforted himself of others. Cobb. But, said he, what if you should forbear a while, and sit still, till you see further how things will go? Bun. Sir, said I, Wycliffe saith, that he which leaveth off preaching and hearing of the word of God for fear of excommunication of men, he is already excommunicated of God, and shall in the day of judgment be counted a traitor to Christ. Point seven. Cobb. I, saith he, they that do not hear shall be so counted indeed, do you, therefore, hear? Bun. But, sir, said I, he saith, he that shall leave off either preaching or hearing, etc. That is, if he hath received a gift for edification, it is his sin, if he doth not lay it out in a way of exhortation and counsel, according to the proportion of his gift, as well as to spend his time altogether in hearing others preach. Cobb. But, said he, how shall we know that you have received a gift? Bun. Said I, let any man hear and search, and prove the doctrine by the Bible. Cobb. But will you be willing, said he, that two indifferent persons shall determine the case. And will you stand by their judgment? Bun. I said, Are they infallible? Cobb. He said, No. Bun. Then, said I, It is possible my judgment may be as good as theirs. But yet I will pass by either, and in this matter be judged by the Scriptures. I am sure that is infallible, and cannot err. Cobb. But, said he, who shall be judged between you, for you take the scriptures one way, and they another? Bun. I said the scripture should, and that by comparing one scripture with another. For that will open itself, if it be rightly compared. As for instance, if under the different apprehensions of the word mediator, you would know the truth of it, the scriptures open it, and tell us that he that is a mediator must take up the business between two. And a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one, and there is one mediator between God and men, even the man Christ Jesus. Gal. 3. 20, 1 Tim. 2. 5. So likewise the scripture calleth Christ a complete, or perfect, or able high priest. That is opened in that he is called man, and also God. His blood also is discovered to be effectually efficacious by the same things. So the scripture, as touching the matter of meeting together, etc., doth likewise sufficiently open itself and discover its meaning. Cobb. But are you willing, said he, to stand to the judgment of the church? Bun. Yes, sir, said I, to the approbation of the church of God, the church's judgment is best expressed in scripture. We had much other discourse which I cannot well remember, about the laws of the nation, and submission to governments. To which I did tell him, that I did look upon myself as bound in conscience to walk according to all righteous laws, and that, whether there was a king or no. And if I did anything that was contrary, I did hold it my duty to bear patiently the penalty of the law, that was provided against such offenders, with many more words to the like effect. And said, moreover, 
that to cut off all occasions of suspicion from any, as touching the harmlessness of my doctrine in private, I would willingly take the pains to give any one the notes of all my sermons. For I do sincerely desire to live quietly in my country, and to submit to the present authority. Cobb. Well, neighbor Bunyan, said he, but indeed I would wish you seriously to consider of these things, between this and the quarter sessions, and to submit yourself. You may do much good if you continue still in the land. But alas, what benefit will it be to your friends, or what good can you do to them, if you should be sent away beyond the seas into Spain, or Constantinople, or some other remote part of the world? Pray be ruled. Jailer. Indeed, sir, I hope you will be ruled. Bun. I shall desire, said I, in all honesty to behave myself in the nation, whilst I am in it. And if I must be so dealt with all, as you say, I hope God will help me to bear what they shall lay upon me. I know no evil that I have done in this matter, to be so used. I speak as in the presence of God. Cobb. You know, saith he, that the scripture saith, the powers that be, are ordained of God. Bun. I said, yes, and that I was to submit to the king as supreme, and also to the governors, as to them who are sent by him. Cobb. Well then, said he, the king then commands you, that you should not have any private meetings. Because it is against his law, and he is ordained of God, therefore you should not have any. Bun. I told him that Paul did own the powers that were in his day, to be of God, and yet he was often in prison under them for all that. And also, though Jesus Christ told Pilate, that he had no power against him, but of God, yet he died under the same Pilate. And yet, said I, I hope you will not say that either Paul, or Christ, were such as did deny magistracy, and so sinned against God in slighting the ordinance. Sir, said I, the law hath provided two ways of obeying, the one to do that which I, in my conscience, do believe that I am bound to do, actively. And where I cannot obey actively, there I am willing to lie down, and to suffer what they shall do unto me. At this he sat still, and said no more, which when he had done, I did thank him for his civil and meek discoursing with me. And so we parted. Oh! That we might meet in heaven. Farewell. J. B. Here followeth a discourse between my wife and the judges, with others, touching my deliverance at the assizes following, the which I took from her own mouth. After that I had received this sentence of banishing, or hanging, from them, and after the former admonition, touching the determination of the justices if I did not recant. Just when the time drew nigh, in which I should have abjured, or have done worse, as Mr. Cobb told me, came the time in which the king was to be crowned. Eight now, at the coronation of kings, there is usually a releasement of divers prisoners, by virtue of his coronation, in which privilege also I should have had my share. But that they took me for a convicted person, and therefore, unless I sued out a pardon, as they called it, I could have no benefit thereby, notwithstanding, yet, forasmuch as the coronation proclamation did give liberty. From the day the king was crowned, to that day twelvemonth, to sue them out. Therefore, though they would not let me out of prison, as they let out thousands, yet they could not meddle with me, as touching the execution of their sentence, because of the liberty offered for the suing out of pardons. Whereupon I continued in prison till the next assizes, which are called Midsummer Assizes, being then kept in August, 1661. Now, at that assizes, because I would not leave any possible means unattempted that might be lawful, I did, by my wife, present a petition to the judges three times, that I might be heard. And that they would impartially take my case into consideration. The first time my wife went, she presented it to Judge Hale, who very mildly received it at her hand, telling her that he would do her and me the best good he could, but he feared, he said, he could do none. The next day, again, lest they should, through the multitude of business, forget me, we did throw another petition into the coach to Judge Twisden. Who, when he had seen it, snapped her up, and angrily told her that I was a convicted person, and could not be released, unless I would promise to preach no more, etc. Well, after this, she yet again presented another to Judge Hale, as he sat on the bench, 
who, as it seemed, was willing to give her audience. Only Justice Chester being present, stepped up and said, that I was convicted in the court, and that I was a hot-spirited fellow, or words to that purpose, whereat he waved it, and did not meddle therewith. But yet, my wife being encouraged by the high sheriff, did venture once more into their presence, as the poor widow did before the unjust judge, to try what she could do with them for my liberty, before they went forth of the town. The place where she went to them, was to the swan chamber, where the two judges, and many justices and gentry of the country, was in company together. She then coming into the chamber with a bashed face, and a trembling heart, began her errand to them in this manner. Woman! My lord, directing herself to Judge Hale, I make bold to come once again to your lordship, to know what may be done with my husband. Judge Hale! To whom he said, Woman, I told thee before I could do thee no good. Because they have taken that for a conviction which thy husband spoke at the sessions, and unless there be something done to undo that, I can do thee no good. Woman! My lord, said she, he is kept unlawfully in prison. They clapped him up before there was any proclamation against the meetings, the indictment also is false. Besides, they never asked him whether he was guilty or no, neither did he confess the indictment. One of the justices. Then one of the justices that stood by, whom she knew not, said, My lord, he was lawfully convicted. W. Um. It is false, said she, for when they said to him, Do you confess the indictment? He said only this, that he had been at several meetings, both where there were preaching the word, and prayer, and that they had God's presence among them. Judge Twisden. Whereat Judge Twisden answered very angrily, saying, What, you think we can do what we list, your husband is a breaker of the peace, and is convicted by the law, etc. Whereupon Judge Hale called for the statute book. W. Um. But, said she, my lord, he was not lawfully convicted. Chester. Then Justice Chester said, My lord, he was lawfully convicted. W. Um. It is false, said she, it was but a word of discourse that they took for a conviction, as you heard before. Chest. But it is recorded, woman, it is recorded, said Justice Chester, as if it must be of necessity true, because it was recorded. With which words he often endeavored to stop her mouth, having no other argument to convince her, but it is recorded, it is recorded. W. Um. My lord, said she, I was a while since at London, to see if I could get my husband's liberty. And there I spoke with my lord Barkwood, one of the House of Lords, to whom I delivered a petition, who took it of me and presented it to some of the rest of the House of Lords, for my husband's releasement. Who, when they had seen it, they said, that they could not release him, but had committed his releasement to the judges, at the next assizes. This he told me. And now I am come to you to see if anything may be done in this business, and you give neither releasement nor relief. To which they gave her no answer, but made as if they heard her not. Chest. Only Justice Chester was often up with this, he is convicted, and it is recorded. W. Um. If it be, it is false, said she. Chest. My lord, said Justice Chester, he is a pestilent fellow, there is not such a fellow in the country again. Chwees. What, will your husband leave preaching? If he will do so, then send for him. W. Um. My lord, said she, he dares not leave preaching as long as he can speak. Chwees. See here, what should we talk any more about such a fellow? Must he do what he lists? He is a breaker of the peace. W. Um. She told him again, that he desired to live peaceably, and to follow his calling, that his family might be maintained. And moreover, said, My lord, I have four small children, that cannot help themselves, one of which is blind, and have nothing to live upon, but the charity of good people. Hale. Hast thou four children? Said Judge Hale. Thou art but a young woman to have four children. W. Um. My lord, said she, I am but mother-in-law to them, having not been married to him yet full two years. Indeed, I was with child when my husband was first apprehended. 
But being young, and unaccustomed to such things, said she, I being smayed nine at the news, fell into labor, and so continued for eight days, and then was delivered, but my child died. Hail! Whereat, he looking very soberly on the matter, said, Alas, poor woman! Tweez! But Judge Twisden told her, that she made poverty her cloak. And said, moreover, that he understood I was maintained better by running up and down a preaching, than by following my calling. Hail! What is his calling? said Judge Hale. Answer. Then some of the company that stood by, said, A tinker, my lord. W. M. Yes, said she, and because he is a tinker, and a poor man, therefore he is despised, and cannot have justice. Hale. Then Judge Hale answered very mildly, saying, I tell thee, woman, seeing it is so, that they have taken what thy husband spake for a conviction, thou must either apply thyself to the king, or sue out his pardon, or get a writ of error. Chest. But when Justice Chester heard him give her this counsel, and especially, as she supposed, because he spoke of a writ of error, he chafed, and seemed to be very much offended, saying, My lord, he will preach and do what he lists. W. M. He preacheth nothing but the word of God, said she. Chweez. He preached the word of God. Said Twisden, and withal, she thought he would have struck her, he runneth up and down, and doth harm. W. M. No, my lord, said she, it is not so. God hath owned him, and done much good by him. Chweez. God. Said he, his doctrine is the doctrine of the devil. W. M. My lord, said she, when the righteous judge shall appear, it will be known that his doctrine is not the doctrine of the devil. Chweez. My lord, said he, to judge Hale, do not mind her, but send her away. Hale. Then said Judge Hale, I am sorry, woman, that I can do thee no good. Thou must do one of those three things aforesaid, namely, either to apply thyself to the king, or sue out his pardon, or get a writ of error, but a writ of error will be cheapest. W. M. At which Chester again seemed to be in a chafe, and put off his hat, and as she thought, scratched his head for anger, but when I saw, said she, that there was no prevailing to have my husband sent for. Though I often desired them that they would send for him, that he might speak for himself. Telling them, that he could give them better satisfaction than I could, in what they demanded of him, with several other things, which now I forget. Only this I remember, that though I was somewhat timorous at my first entrance into the chamber, yet before I went out, I could not but break forth into tears, not so much because they were so hard-hearted against me, and my husband. But to think what a sad account such poor creatures will have to give at the coming of the Lord, when they shall their answer for all things whatsoever they have done in the body, whether it be good, or whether it be bad. So, when I departed from them, the book of statutes was brought, but what they said of it I know nothing at all, neither did I hear any more from them. Some carriages of the adversaries of God's truth with me at the next assizes, which was on the nineteenth of the first month, 1662. I shall pass by what befell between these two assizes, how I had, by my jailer, some liberty granted me, more than at the first, and how I followed my wonted course of preaching. Taking all occasions that were put into my hand to visit the people of God. Exhorting them to be steadfast in the faith of Jesus Christ, and to take heed that they touched not the common prayer, etc. But to mind the word of God, which giveth direction to Christians in every point, being able to make the man of God perfect in all things through faith in Jesus Christ, and thoroughly to furnish him unto all good works. 2 Tim, 3. 17. Also how I having, I say, somewhat more liberty, did go to see the Christians at London. Which my enemies hearing of, were so angry, that they had almost cast my jailer out of his place, threatening to indict him, and to do what they could against him. They charged me also, that I went thither to plot and raise division, and make insurrection, which, God knows, was a slander, whereupon my liberty was more straitened than it was before, so that I must not now look out of the door. Well, when the next sessions came, which was about the tenth of the eleventh month, 1661, 
I did expect to have been very roundly dealt with all. But they passed me by, and would not call me, so that I rested till the Assizes, which was held the nineteenth of the first month, 1662, following. And when they came, because I had a desire to come before the judge, I desired my jailer to put my name into the calendar among the felons, and made friends of the judge and high sheriff. Who promised that I should be called, so that I thought what I had done might have been effectual for the obtaining of my desire, but all was in vain. For when the assizes came, though my name was in the calendar, and also though both the judge and sheriff had promised that I should appear before them, yet the justices and the clerk of the peace did so work it about, that I, notwithstanding, was deferred, and was not suffered to appear, and although I say, I do not know of all their carriages towards me, yet this I know, that the clerk of the peace, Mr. Cobb, did discover himself to be one of my greatest opposers, for, first he came to my jailer and told him that I must not go down before the judge, and therefore must not be put into the calendar. To whom my jailer said, that my name was in already. He bid him put it out again, my jailer told him that he could not, for he had given the judge a calendar with my name in it, and also the sheriff another. At which he was very much displeased, and desired to see that calendar that was yet in my jailer's hand, who, when he had given it him, he looked on it, and said it was a false calendar. He also took the calendar and blotted out my accusation, as my jailer had written it, which accusation I cannot tell what it was, because it was so blotted out, and he himself put in words to this purpose, that John Bunyan was committed to prison. Being lawfully convicted for upholding of unlawful meetings and conventicles, etc. But yet for all this, fearing that what he had done, unless he added thereto, it would not do, he first ran to the clerk of the assizes. Then to the justices, and afterwards, because he would not leave any means unattempted to hinder me, he came again to my jailer, and told him, that if I did go down before the judge, and was released, he would make him pay my fees. Which he said was due to him. And further, told him, that he would complain of him at the next quarter sessions for making of false calendars, though my jailer himself, as I afterwards learned, had put in my accusation worse than in itself it was by far. And thus was I hindered and prevented at that time also from appearing before the judge, and left in prison. Farewell. John Bunyan. A continuation of Mr. Bunyan's life, beginning where he left off, and concluding with the time and manner of his death and burial, together with his true character, etc. Reader, the painful and industrious author of this book, has already given you a faithful and very moving relation of the beginning middle of the days of his pilgrimage on earth. And since there yet remains somewhat worthy of notice and regard, which occurred in the last scene of his life, the which, for want of time, or fear, some over-censorious people should impute it to him as an earnest coveting of praise from men. He has not left behind him in writing. Wherefore, as a true friend, and long acquaintance of Mr. Bunyan's that his good end may be known, as well as his evil beginning, I have taken upon me, from my knowledge, and the best account given by other of his friends. To piece this to the thread too soon broke off, and so lengthen it out to his entering upon eternity. He has told you at large, of his birth and education, the evil habits and corruptions of his youth. The temptations he struggled and conflicted so frequently with, the mercies, comforts, and deliverances he found, how he came to take upon him the preaching of the gospel. The slanders, reproaches and imprisonments that attended him, and the progress he notwithstanding made, by the assistance of God's grace, no doubt to the saving of many souls, therefore take these things. As he himself hath methodically laid them down in the words of verity. And so I pass on to what remains. After his being freed from his twelve years' imprisonment and upwards, for nonconformity, wherein he had time to furnish the world with sundry good books, etc. And by his patience, to move Dr. Barlow, the then Bishop of Lincoln, and other churchmen, to pity his hard and unreasonable sufferings, so far as to stand very much his friends, in procuring his enlargement, or there perhaps he had died. By the noisomeness and ill usage of the place. Being now, I say, again at liberty, and having through mercy shaken off his bodily fetters, for those upon his soul were broken before by the abounding grace that filled his heart. He went to visit those that had been a comfort to him in his tribulation, 
with a Christian-like acknowledgement of their kindness and enlargement of charity. Giving encouragement by his example, if it happened to be their hard haps to fall into affliction or trouble, then to suffer patiently for the sake of a good conscience, and for the love of God in Jesus Christ towards their souls. And by many cordial persuasions, supported some whose spirits began to sink low, through the fear of danger that threatened their worldly concernment, so that the people found a wonderful consolation in his discourse and admonitions. As often as opportunity would admit, he gathered them together, though the law was then in force against meetings, in convenient places, and fed them with the sincere milk of the word, that they might grow up in grace thereby. To such as were anywhere taken and imprisoned upon these accounts, he made it another part of his business to extend his charity, and gather relief for such of them as wanted. He took great care to visit the sick, and strengthen them against the suggestions of the tempter, which at such times are very prevalent. So that they had cause for ever to bless God, who had put it into his heart, at such a time, to rescue them from the power of the roaring lion, who sought to devour them. Nor did he spare any pains or labor in travel, though to remote counties, where he knew or imagined any people might stand in need of his assistance. Insomuch that some, by these visitations that he made, which was two or three every year, some, though in a jeering manner no doubt, gave him the epithet of Bishop Bunyan, whilst others envied him for his so earnestly laboring in Christ's vineyard. Yet the seed of the word he, all this while, sowed in the hearts of his congregation, watered with the grace of God, brought forth in abundance, in bringing in disciples to the Church of Christ. Another part of his time is spent in reconciling differences, by which he hindered many mischiefs, and saved some families from ruin, and in such fallings out he was uneasy, till he found a means to labor a reconciliation. And become a peacemaker, on whom a blessing is promised in holy writ. And indeed in doing this good office, he may be said to sum up his days, it being the last undertaking of his life, as will appear in the close of this paper. When in the late reign, liberty of conscience was unexpectedly given and indulged to dissenters of all persuasions, his piercing wit penetrated the veil. And found that it was not for the dissenters' sakes they were so suddenly freed from the hard prosecutions that had long lain heavy upon them, and set in a manner, on an equal foot with the Church of England, which the Papists were undermining. And about to subvert, he foresaw all the advantages that could have redounded to the dissenters would have been no more than what Polyphemus, the monstrous giant of Sicily, would have allowed Ulysses, viz. That he would eat his men first, and do him the favor of being eaten last, for although Mr. Bunyan, following the examples of others, did lay hold of this liberty, as an acceptable thing in itself, knowing God is the only Lord of conscience. And that it is good at all times to do according to the dictates of a good conscience, and that the preaching the glad tidings of the gospel is beautiful in the preacher. Yet in all this he moved with caution and a holy fear, earnestly praying for the averting impending judgments, which he saw, like a black tempest, hanging over our heads for our sins, and ready to break in upon us. And that the Ninevites remedy was now highly necessary, hereupon he gathered his congregation at Bedford, where he mostly lived, and had lived and spent the greatest part of his life. And there being no convenient place to be had for the entertainment of so great a confluence of people as followed him upon the account of his teaching, he consulted with them for the building of a meeting house. To which they made their voluntary contributions with all cheerfulness and alacrity. And the first time he appeared there to edify, the place was so thronged, that many was constrained to stay without, though the house was very spacious, every one striving to partake of his instructions, that were of his persuasion and show their goodwill towards him, by being present at the opening of the place. And here he lived in much peace and quiet of mind, contenting himself with that little God had bestowed upon him, and sequestering himself from all secular employments, to follow that of his call to the ministry. For as God said to Moses, He that made the lips and heart, can give eloquence and wisdom, without extraordinary acquirements in an university. During these things, there were regulators sent into all cities and towns corporate, to new model the government in the magistracy, etc. By turning out some, and putting in others, against this Mr. Bunyan expressed his zeal with some weariness, as foreseeing the bad consequence that would attend it, and labored with his congregation to prevent their being imposed on in this kind. And when a great man in those days, 
coming to Bedford upon some such errand, sent for him, as, tis supposed, to give him a place of public trust, he would by no means come at him, but sent his excuse. When he was at leisure from writing and teaching, he often came up to London, and there went among the congregations of the nonconformists, and used his talent to the great good liking of the hearers. And even some to whom he had been misrepresented, upon the account of his education, were convinced of his worth and knowledge in sacred things, as perceiving him to be a man of round judgment, delivering himself plainly and powerfully. Insomuch that many, who came mere spectators for novelty's sake rather than to edify and be improved, went away well satisfied with what they heard, and wondered, as the Jews did at the apostles, viz., whence this man should have these things. Perhaps not considering that God more immediately assists those that make it their business industriously and cheerfully to labor in his vineyard. Thus he spent his latter years in imitation of his great Lord and Master, the ever-blessed Jesus. He went about doing good, so that the most prying critic, or even malice herself, is defied to find, even upon the narrowest search or observation, any sully or stain upon his reputation, with which he may be justly charged. And this we note, as a challenge to those that have the least regard for him, or them of his persuasion, and have one way or other appeared in the front of those that oppressed him. And for the turning whose hearts, in obedience to the commission and commandment given him of God, he frequently prayed, and sometimes sought a blessing for them, even with tears, the effects of which, they may, peradventure, though undeservedly, have found in their persons, friends, relations, or estates. For God will hear the prayer of the faithful, and answer them, even for them that vex them, as it happened in the case of Job's praying for the three persons that had been grievous in their reproach against him, even in the day of his sorrow. But yet let me come a little nearer to particulars and periods of time, for the better refreshing the memories of those that knew his labor and suffering, and for the satisfaction of all that shall read this book. After he was sensibly convicted of the wicked state of his life, and converted, he was baptized into the congregation, and admitted a member thereof, viz., in the year 1655, and became speedily a very zealous professor. But upon the return of King Charles to the crown in 1660, he was the 12th of November taken, as he was edifying some good people that were got together to hear the word, and confined in Bedford jail for the space of six years. Till the act of indulgence to dissenters being allowed, he obtained his freedom, by the intercession of some in trust and power, that took pity on his sufferings. But within six years afterwards he was again taken up, viz. In the year 1666, and was then confined for six years more, when even the jailer took such pity of his rigorous sufferings, that he did as the Egyptian jailer did to Joseph, put all the care and trust in his hand, when he was taken this last time. He was preaching on these words, viz. Dost thou believe the Son of God? And this imprisonment continued six years, and when this was over, another short affliction, which was an imprisonment of half a year, fell to his share. During these confinements he wrote the following books, viz., Of Prayer by the Spirit, The Holy City's Resurrection, Grace Abounding, Pilgrim's Progress, the first part. In the last year of his twelve years' imprisonment, the pastor of the congregation at Bedford died, and he was chosen to that care of souls, on the 12th of December, 1671. And in this his charge, he often had disputes with scholars that came to oppose him, as supposing him an ignorant person, and though he argued plainly, and by scripture, without phrases and logical expressions. Yet he nonplussed one who came to oppose him in his congregation, by demanding, whether or no we had the true copies of the original scriptures. And another, when he was preaching, accused him of uncharitableness, for saying, it was very hard for most to be saved, saying, by that he went about to exclude most of his congregation. But he confuted him, and put him to silence with the parable of the stony ground, and other texts out of the thirteenth chapter of St. Matthew, in our Saviour's sermon out of a ship. All his methods being to keep close to the Scriptures, and what he found not warranted there, himself would not warrant nor determine, unless in such cases as were plain, wherein no doubts or scruples did arise. But not to make any further mention of this kind, it is well known that this person managed all his affairs with such exactness, as if he had made it his study, above all other things, not to give occasion of offence. 
but rather suffer many inconveniences, to avoid being never heard to reproach or revile any, what injury soever he received, but rather to rebuke those that did. And as it was in his conversation, so it is manifested in those books he has caused to be published to the world. We're like the archangel disputing with Satan about the body of Moses, as we find it in the epistle of St. Jude, brings no railing accusation, but leaves the rebukers, those that persecuted him, to the Lord. In his family he kept up a very strict discipline in prayer and exhortation, being in this like Joshua, as the good man expresses it, viz. Whatsoever others did, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, and indeed a blessing waited on his labors and endeavors, so that his wife, as the psalmist says, was like a pleasant vine upon the walls of his house. And his children like olive branches round his table. For so shall it be with the man that fears the Lord, and though by reason of the many losses he sustained by imprisonment and spoil, of his chargeable sickness, etc., his earthly treasure swelled not to excess. He always had sufficient to live decently and creditably, and with that he had the greatest of all treasures, which is content, for as the wise man says, that is a continual feast. But where content dwells, even a poor cottage is a kingly palace, and this happiness he had all his life long. Not so much minding this world, as knowing he was here as a pilgrim and stranger, and had no tarrying city, but looked for one made with hands eternal in the highest heavens, but at length was worn out with sufferings, age, and often teaching. The day of his dissolution drew near, and death, that unlocks the prison of the soul, to enlarge it for a more glorious mansion, put a stop to his acting his part on the stage of mortality. Heaven, like earthly princes, when it threatens war, being always so kind as to call home its ambassadors before it be denounced, and even the last act or undertaking of his, was a labor of love and charity. For it so falling out that a young gentleman, a neighbor of Mr. Bunyan's, happening into the displeasure of his father, and being much troubled in mind upon that account, and also for that he heard his father purpose to disinherit him, or otherwise deprive him of what he had to leave. He pitched upon Mr. Bunyan as a fit man to make way for his submission, and prepare his father's mind to receive him, and he, as willing to do any good office, as it could be requested, as readily undertook it. And so writing to reading in Berkshire, he then there used such pressing arguments and reasons against anger and passion, as also for love and reconciliation, that the father was mollified, and his bowels yearned to his returning son. But Mr. Bunyan, after he had disposed all things to the best for accommodation, returning to London, and being overtaken with excessive rains, coming to his lodgings extremely wet, fell sick of a violent fever. Which he bore with much constancy and patience, and expressed himself as if he desired nothing more than to be dissolved, and be with Christ, in that case esteeming death as gain, and life only a tedious delaying felicity expected. And finding his vital strength decay, having settled his mind and affairs, as well as the shortness of time, and the violence of his disease would permit, with a constant and Christian patience. He resigned his soul into the hands of his most merciful Redeemer, following his pilgrim from the city of destruction, to the new Jerusalem. His better part having been all along there, in holy contemplation, pantings and breathings after the hidden manna and water of life, as by many holy and humble consolations expressed in his letters to several persons in prison, and out of prison. Too many to be inserted at present. He died at the house of one Mr. Struddock, a grocer, at the Star on Snow Hill, in the parish of St. Sepulchre's, London, on the 12th of August, 1688, and in the sixtieth year of his age, ten after ten days sickness. And was buried in the new burying place near the artillery ground, where he sleeps to the morning of the resurrection, in hopes of a glorious rising to an incorruptible immortality of joy and happiness. Where no more trouble and sorrow shall afflict him, but all tears be wiped away, when the just shall be incorporated as members of Christ their head, and reign with him as kings and priests forever. A brief character of Mr. John Bunyan. He appeared in countenance to be of a stern and rough temper, but in his conversation mild and affable, not given to loquacity or much discourse in company, unless some urgent occasion required it. Observing never to boast of himself or his parts, but rather seem low in his own eyes, and submit himself to the judgment of others, abhorring lying and swearing, 
being just in all that lay in his power to his word, not seeming to revenge injuries. Loving to reconcile differences, and make friendship with all. He had a sharp quick eye, accompanied with an excellent discerning of persons, being of good judgment and quick wit. As for his person, he was tall of stature, strong-boned, though not corpulent, somewhat of a ruddy face, with sparkling eyes, wearing his hair on his upper lip, after the old British fashion. His hair reddish, but in his latter days, time had sprinkled it with grey, his nose well set, but not declining or bending, and his mouth moderate large, his forehead somewhat high, and his habit always plain and modest. And thus have we impartially described the internal and external parts of a person, whose death hath been much regretted, a person who had tried the smiles and frowns of time, not puffed up in prosperity, nor shaken in adversity. Always holding the golden mean. In him at once did three great worthies shine. Historian, poet, and a choice divine. Then let him rest in undisturbed dust. Until the resurrection of the just. Postscript. In this his pilgrimage, God blessed him with four children, one of which, named Mary, was blind, and died some years before, his other children were Thomas, Joseph, and Sarah. His wife Elizabeth having lived to see him overcome his labor and sorrow, and pass from this life to receive the reward of his work, long survived him not. But in 1692 she died, to follow her faithful pilgrim from this world to the other, whither he was gone before her, whilst his works, which consist of sixty books, remain for the edifying of the reader, and praise of the author. Veil. The End.